Okay. Um, uh, as you know, I prefer exact starts, so it's 15-15, and we will start. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you at a already sixth Sustainable Use Directive Symposium. Uh, this year we will focus on the arable crops, as properly suggested by our chairman last year. I take this opportunity to introduce again, sixth time, our chairman, which is always the one and only Professor Michael Hamel. <laughs> um, uh, I would like to thank our organizational partners as well, the International Organization for Biological Control, our researchers, as uh, continued research and European fundings for innovation and sustainable agriculture is a vital component in ensuring this uh, progression trend, progressing trends continues. Also, International Biocontrol Manufacturer Association, IBMA, um, Biocontrol Industries produce solutions with microorganisms, macroorganisms, semiochemicals, and natural products for plant protection. And last but not least, the Pesticide Pesticides Action Network Europe, my favorite and beloved, a NGO, Brussels-based, working to minimize effects and replace the use of hazardous chemicals with ecologically sound alternatives. And believe me, they are working hard on this. Uh, just to mention a few technical issues, uh, we have a translation in English on Channel 2. We have a French translation on Channel 3 and Italian on Channel 4. You should also know that Symposium is web-streamed live in Germany, Portugal, Switzerland and Sweden, and it will be followed by local debates in a number of universities. We thank you for this and uh, uh, we hope that you all everywhere uh, can hear us and see us uh, well. And uh, I would also like to ask uh, speakers to use only left side micro because we have sort of automatic aiming system uh, and we have to help these, these all electronic friends to, uh, uh, to work. To the content, uh, just a few words. Uh, Arab crops is a challenging field, but uh, this is a challenge that must be tackled. It is an important step in the development of the integrated pest management in all agriculture. In the IPN triangle, the good agronomic practices are an essential base. Uh, EU Sustainable Plant Protection Group proposed and was endorsed by the Council of Ministers for a 40-point section plan bringing IPM as a standard practice within EU agriculture and providing more low-risk plant protection tools to European farmers alongside with all the other tools, such as agronomic and mechanic ones. Uh, on Directive 2009-128, uh, sustainable, on sustainable use of pesticides, I only need to say that my honorable colleague Jutta Guteland from Sweden was appointed, appointed a SND reporter for the implementation report, and she will join us uh, for last panel today. Her work is closely related to the implementation report on the plant protection product regulation on which I am working as a, as a reporter currently, uh, but uh, because uh, speaking more about the implementation of the plant protection product regulation is for me a bit depressive after the first research on this topic, so I pass to the Michael to guide us through this marvelous event. Michael. Thank you, Pavel, and at the very outset, thank you for the continued support that you have given to this symposium year upon year. It's not an exaggeration to say that the work of the organizations that have sponsored or have uh, supported this and developed this conference year after year uh, is dependent on you for entry into the European Parliament, for discussion within the confines of the Parliament on a subject very close to the citizen, very close to the farmer. And your continued support is immensely important. The focus of this meeting, as you said, 
is the 2009 Sustainable Use of Pesticides Directive, its implementation, and especially with respect to Integrated Pest Management, IPM. In previous years, the symposium has dealt with many aspects of implementation and the problems related to the achievement of IPM, which clearly through each of the symposia has the support of farmers, has the support of the industry in its widest sense, and has the support of consumers. Now, that support, and I've asked for comments in that line each year, that support has always been reaffirmed, not always without caveats, but always with a desire to improve the health and the well-being of all concerned and the broader environment. And the caveats, I'm afraid, mimic St. Augustine, for those of you who follow great religious movements. Lord, give us IPM, but not yet. 2009 to now is nine years, so maybe not yet can be said sotto voce. Previous symposia have laid emphasis on what IPM is. The simple triangle of good agricultural practice, including rotations, monitoring, forecasting, warning systems, natural and biological control, and then, where necessary, chemical control. The symposia are building up a base of knowledge. We've looked at the greenhouse sector. We've looked at the apple sector. We've looked at grapes, table grapes, and grapes for wine production. We provided the state of play and progress on IPM and problems along the way in all of those sectors. There has been strong criticism of the absence of the 2014 Commission report on Member State implementation, and largely through the work of PAN, but through the work of others also, a considerable criticism of the lack of ambition in Member States' implementation of the Directive and in their plans in order to implement the Directive. Criticism, too, of the registration process, of funding, not just for research, but for research, of for education, and criticism of what appears to be a hesitant buy-in to the practicalities of IPM as opposed to the favourable remarks in terms of wanting it to happen. Today's symposium, as Pavel has said, tackles the arable sector. This would have been inconceivable six years ago when we started the process. IPM was seen as something for greenhouses and not much more. And here we are in the field. It's divided into three parts. The first focuses on soil. The second with mainstreaming IPM into arable. And the third with integrating IPM into policy and practice. So three different parts. When I was a child, we were told by Caesar that all Gaul was divided in three parts. This conference, or this symposium, is divided in three parts, and France will play an important part in it. 
We've had the Commission report on implementation since last October. We still have unfinished business with regard to the Sustainable Use Directive and the Common Agricultural Policy and the linkage there. And we still have across Europe a perilous situation for biodiversity and for water which are not unrelated to, to the non-sustainable use of pesticides. So we have much to discuss and we have an excellent panel of speakers and subsequently an excellent panel of commentators and I want a great amount of participation from the floor and I will ensure that that takes place. So let's go to the first part straight away. There are three speakers. Luca Montanarella on my left from the JRC, Celine Pelosi from INRA and Fabrice Martin Laurent from INRA. And we start with you Luca. It's a pleasure to introduce you. We started working together, and I can't say this for anybody else in the room, so this is the one and only speech of introduction of somebody. We started working together on soil protection 30 years ago, or sorry, 20 years ago. Um, you can make your own judgments on whether we made any progress or not. <laughs> Luca. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you for the introduction, and, and thank you for the invitation to, sp to speak here, and good afternoon to everybody. As Michael was saying, I'm working at the European Commission in the service of the European Commission called Joint Research Center. For the ones who are not familiar with it, this is the service of the Commission that is there to provide science, policy, and data to support our colleagues who do policy. In that case, uh, when we started 20 years ago to think about uh, uh, EU soil policy for soil protection, providing information, data, and support for that policy area. Indeed, I'm, my job is essentially to work on soils, so here I was asked to tell you a few things about soils in Europe, particularly the threats to soils and particularly some status, methods, drivers, and effects on ecosystem services. Um, to, to, to present something like this would probably need a lot of time, so I will try to be focused, but I would like to spend um, at least a few words on something that is very important to us and particularly to me which is um, the absolute need to base what we do on facts, figures, data, measurements, and not on uh, virtual realities or what nowadays is called fake news or impressions. This for soils, of course, is a little bit complicated because when you want to talk about soils, about facts about soils, uh, you need to do something which we call the soil scientists to dig a soil profile. You need to go in the field, dig a hole, uh, observe what you see, take a sample, bring it to the lab. And this is quite a time-consuming exercise, by the way, a very instructive exercise in my view, but it brings you back to reality and it brings you back to the facts and figures that you need when you want to then take some decisions. Now, the, from the moment that we start uh, collecting data, uh, so collecting samples, till the moment that we produce what we call an assessment that goes then on your tables, uh, as a report or as something that you can use in your work, uh, that's a long process, and we have been investing a lot of time and effort in documenting very de in a very detailed way how we get from the field observation of soil properties till the final assessment of the situation of soils for certain threats or for certain parameters you're interested in. Now, usually doing that requires also combining your soil data with other information. I will give you an example of that, because just talking about soils in, in isolation is not reality. Reality is that soils are embedded in a landscape, are embedded in a society, are embedded in an economic field, are embedded in a lot of things that needs to be taken into consideration when you do an integrated assessment on a complicated topic, a complex issue, like soils. Now, uh, we do this at the European Commission through something that we established already 
but some years ago, actually nearly 20 years ago, as Michael was saying, uh, you may access all soil information data and all what we do freely over the European Soil Data Center. The European Soil Data Center is hosted by the European Commission Joint Reason Center, and it's collecting all policy-relevant information coming from very different sources. We take data directly from our member states, but of course we also have a number of other data flows coming from commission activities, like, for example, our own research activities, but also our own monitoring and data collection exercises, and I will talk a little bit more about that. Um, the data center has a backbone. The backbone soil information system is what you see here. It's the European soil information system, which is going far beyond by now the 28 EU member states. Uh, this for the simple reason that very uh, early we realized that our bordering countries were very interested to join this system, but as well that many of the policies that we have to support with our data information are going beyond the borders of the EU, and that's why actually we are pretty active also now at global scale in supporting various agencies uh, at global scale like FAO, UNEP, and various uh, multilateral environmental agreements. Uh, now, uh, we, we, you don't only need to have maps and GIS systems and data in a spatial distribution, but if you want to make a statement about trends, you need also to have the possibility to detect changes over time. Changes over time requires that you go and do what we call monitoring. Monitoring means you go over time in the same spot, you take a sample, you measure what you want to measure, and you can compare then your results over time. This is, again, an extremely extremely time-consuming and costly exercise. We are lucky that by now we have established our own system, which is the system that we currently operate as European Commission, which is called LUCAS. So we stand for the European Land Use Land Cover uh, Frame Statistical Survey. It's a pretty structured system that goes on already since several years, based on 1,100,000 points on a regular grid at two-kilometer spacing all over the EU. That is, of course, a huge data set containing uh, a lot of information about land use, land cover, but since 2009 also about soils because our surveyors also go and take a soil sample. And I will talk a little bit more about that because that gives us the possibility to detect reality. What is actually happening in EU soils and what are the current situation concerning certain parameters? Now, of course, you can imagine it's very expensive to go on 1,100,000 points every three years. So we usually do what we call a stratification, so we make a selection of points based on certain criteria, particularly criteria of what is more interesting, interesting to us, uh, so essentially type of land use. Very often we are much more interested in agricultural soils than in other types of soils, so there is a stratification exercise that allows us to then go just on roughly 250,000 points of those, then a number is sampled for soil parameters. Now, just now it's going on the training in Lissabon for the new tr uh, survey that we are doing in 2018. We did the first survey of soil uh, on this grid in 2009. The next one was done in 2015, and the current one is 2018, so every three years. And this is a highly documented system that allows them to derive a number of properties. I don't want to go into detail of what we measure, but two things are fundamental to be successful in this exercise. is the very, very high standardization of what we do. So we have been ruling out all the problems that we had in the past in comparing data across EU member states. That has usually been a high problem due to the very difficult issue of um, interlaboratory calibration and of very large differences in methods and in analytical methods used in laboratories at national level. And the second one is that we maintain an European soil archive. So you have a permanent archive of samples that you can go back and reanalyze for certain parameters if you are interested. And of course, having tens of thousands of soil samples within a very georeference location is a big wealth of information that you can go back if you have any doubts about some issue. Now, what do we measure as things that are policy relevant? One of the most policy relevant things recently is soil organic carbon. You may know that we have a big stock of soil organic carbon in soils, and this is quite a relevant parameter for many reasons more recently for climate change issues, because if you mineralize those, so, those carbon, this will go in the atmosphere and you increase your CO2 balance. And of course, this is not very 
positive for our general greenhouse gas balance. So we have now the results of our Lucas survey on uh, sol organic carbon that tell us that sol organic carbon is consistently declining in European soils, and actually the estimates that we had uh, 20 years ago was hugely overestimated. We have much less carbon left than we originally sold. Now, there are many other parameters that we measure in that survey that are more relevant to, uh, health, uh, to, to, to human health, particularly, and to our food safety. Um, here I show the distribution of major heavy metals. I don't want to go into detail, but that's just to tell you that we measure heavy metals concentration in European soils that, of course, uh, sometimes concern because they can enter the food chain. There was a big debate recently on cadmium, for example, around the fertilizer regulation, but also other issues like uh, copper in vineyards and so on. Now, let me just make one example of a more integrated assessment, and I will do this on the soil erosion issue. This is because soil erosion is remaining a major threat to European soils. Now, the soil erosion assessment is a typical example where we combine data from many different sources, not only the soil observations, but also meteorological data, because you need to have rainfall data. Uh, you have to have slope information because it depends on your slope if you have erosion or not, and of course also land cover and vegetation cover and management practices. And I will not go into detail, but this just to explain to you the complexity of an assessment for just one of those threats. Now the result of such an exercise is a number of maps of different parameters, for example, soil erosivity, which depends on type of soil, or rainfall erosivity, which depends on rainfall intensity. And the, usually the result that then goes up to our colleagues doing more policy is maps of this kind, where you have the distribution of the rate of erosions in tons per hectare per year of soil loss, uh, usually aggregated by administrative units, which is the map that you see on the right-hand side, uh, which is, of course, then helpful if you want to take policy decision on that parameters. And as you can see, it's pretty reddish in the Mediterranean area because the Mediterranean typically experiences quite high erosion rates uh, above the 10 tons per hectare per year, which is considered in general as the threshold where erosion becomes a serious problem. Now, of course, when you do this type of products and assessment, you can combine then this with other things which are also very interesting. Uh, quite interesting was what we did end of last year when we published a paper that made some noise, which was a combination of our soil erosion assessment for wind, so wind erosion, together with the measurements of pesticide residues in LUCA samples. And as you know, we have also measuring, for example, residues of glyphosate and its metabolite, uh, AMPA, which is the paper just here on the screen, and where we combine the results of the distribution of glyphosate and its metabolite together with the areas which are mostly prone to wind erosion. Why is this interesting? Because, of course, um, you may have that uh, the areas which have a high wind erosion rate are also high in having some of these residues, and you could assume that some of these residues uh, are attached to the particles that get into the atmosphere through the wind erosion process. So you could have here one um, way of uh, transfer of the molecules from the uh, soil to the atmosphere, and then, of course, eventually being inhalated by humans or by others. Um, so uh, this was a paper that was just showing how you can combine different information coming from the same survey, so we're talking here of the data from the Lucas survey that I was just mentioning, with other information coming from the modeling exercise on wind erosion, which is quite interesting. Typically, you will have more wind erosion where there's less vegetation cover, and obviously, if you use more herbicide, you have less vegetation cover, so it's pretty obvious results, which honestly didn't surprise us that much. Now, all this feeds into a number of reports that you can find everywhere. We are there to provide data for official reporting to different agencies, not only internally to the Commission services, but also to OECD, to all the agencies that require reporting about soils. And of course, now coming to the uh, question, uh, what is the status of the European soils, we should refer back to the most recent comprehensive assessment that we did. We did this together with the Global Soil Partnership, with the Intergovernmental Technical Panel on Soils, where in 2015 was released 
the uh, most updated status of world soil resources, which contains more than 600 pages, but what, which contains particularly a specific chapter about European soils. And I just show you the synthesis table of the European chapter, where you will have the ranking of the major degradation processes occurring in the European region. And be, be aware, we are talking here of the UN European regions, not of the EU, so the region that you see depicted up there, which is pretty bigger than the European Union, but which has a ranking with the trends of the various threats. And what was ranking first as the major threat in our region is soil sealing and land take by housing and infrastructure. So this is um, what this assessment has been produced as the first problem in our region with a pretty negative trend. As you can see, the trend lines are these errors in the columns. I don't know if you can see it. The screens are pretty small. Um, the second ranking threat uh, was, uh, interestingly, soil salinization and sodification. This for the simple reason that this region covers many Central Asian republics that belonged to the uh, former Soviet Union, which have very serious salinization problems. So that's just the explanation. But the third ranking uh, threat was soil contamination with, a very interestingly, a positive trend in the sense that the assessment showed that there is improvement in this region concerning soil contamination, mostly because there is some improvement in handling contaminated sites. As you know, we have a heritage of roughly 3 million contaminated sites in Europe, and there is quite some effort going on in some countries in remediating contaminated sites. I don't go through the ranking of all the threats. I mean, you will find a decline of soil organic carbon, loss of soil biodiversity, um, soil compaction, many others. There's not enough time to go into detail, but that should tell you that this is available and you can consult it. The second uh, assessment that came out in the same year, 2015, by the way, 2015 was the UN International Year of Soils. That's why there was so much done on soils in 2015. Uh, is the assessment done by the European Environment Agency with the support from us, from the GRC, which is essentially coming to the same conclusions of the uh, global assessment for Europe, Indeed, we have here in Europe still a persisting problem of soil degradation uh, by contamination, by soil sealing, by loss of soil organic carbon, and so on. Now, uh, coming to the final part of this brief presentation, which was aiming also to address ecosystem services and the fact that, of course, soil degradation is affecting um, life in soil, uh, and soils are alive, by the way. Uh, and to prove that soils are alive, by the way, we have made a big investment as the European Commission in publishing last year the Global Soil Biodiversity Atlas. I have just one copy, but I'm happy to leave it here. Uh, but you can freely available, available from the European Commission or downloadable from our website. And this is an assessment of soil biodiversity because soil biodiversity is a pretty unknown uh, biodiversity pool a bit neglected in the sense that people think soils are dead, so no reason to care for them, but soils are not dead. They are alive. They are a big engine that is performing many services to us uh, that are very crucial. And, of course, if you have degradation of soils, these services may be lost, and you can find in that document all the details about these interactions between soil degradation, ecosystem services, and soil biodiversity. So let me conclude with uh, more recent things and a little bit an outlook. You may know that there is now a growing attention at global scale for soil contamination and soil pollution. Um, you may know that uh, the last United Nations Environment Assembly in December last year that was decided to have uh, an assessment, a global assessment by UNEP on soil pollution. Um, this, of course, will trigger, I think, quite some activities in the next uh, year or years on soil contamination and soil pollution globally. Uh, we just released within the Global Soil Partners another booklet that I have only one copy, but again, you can download it, which is the global assessment of the impact of plant protection products on soil functions and soil ecosystems. I'm sorry, I have just one copy, but it's freely downloadable from the Global Soil Partnership website. And the second thing I would like to announce is that the, we will organize a major event on soil contamination, soil pollution, hosted by FAO together with the other UN agencies, namely the GSP, the Global Soil Partnership, the Intergovernmental Technical Panel on Soils, UNEP, uh, the World Health Organization, the Basel Convention, and the Stockholm Convention in Rome uh, in May. You have there the announcement and I hope that many, some of you will attend. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you, Luca. I think the, the wisest thing is to leave the questions till the end because the sessions are, are so clearly delineated. So with, uh, without further ado then, unless somebody uh, has something very critical, and even if they have, the answer is no, um, let's go on to Celine Pelosi from INRA in Versailles, whose subject is how pesticides are affecting earthworms. So, Celine. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. So, I'm Celine. I'm from France. Uh, I am a soil ecotoxicologist, and I work at INRA, which is the National Institute of Agronomical Research in France. I'm based in Versailles, and I'm going to talk about how pesticides are affecting earthworms. So, as uh, Luca mentioned, um, to assess the impact of entropic activities and the threats to ecosystems, we use biomonitoring procedures that can be done under laboratory or field conditions. And both approaches have uh, different levels of precision in the results and relevance for a policy. So, in that context, we can use bioindicators, which are a species or a group of species which occurrence gives some information on the, the, the quality of the ecosystem. And these bioindicators are used, can be used to assess the impacts of anthropic activities, to describe the systems, and to follow their evolution after a change. Um, to be uh, relevant, to assess the impact of pesticides, the bioindicators must be representative of the areas where pesticides are applied. They, if possible, play, they must play an important functional role in the systems, in the ecosystems, and they have to be sensitive in an agricultural context, which means a low concentration of chemicals but a repeated and chronic exposure. Uh, in cultivated fields, earthworms represent, our, uh, represent about 80% uh, of soil living biomass, and they are heavily involved in uh, functioning because they um, ensure uh, some functions such as the evolution of organic matter and soil structure, and they are as well uh, prey for different types of organ living organisms. So depending on the species and on the ecological groups to which they belong, uh, they have different roles and they live in different places and feed different things. So concerning the sensitivity, it's described as physiological, morphological, phenological, or behavioral change or response after an, an exposure to a, a pollutant. Um, and the sensitivity depends on the species, so the feeding habits or the, um, the place uh, where they live. For instance, Ezenia fetida is a species that is recommended in the international norms. Since the 80s, it has been chosen because it has, it has a, a short generation time and it's easy to breed, quite easy to breed. So uh, today, it's used in this uh, a norm. It's re recommended in this norm that allow to assess the impacts of pollutants on uh, mortality, survival of, the of earthworms, reproduction, and behavior. And uh, these tests are used for the re before the registration of pesticides. And um, so this, this species, Ezenia fetida, is used in about 80% of ecotoxicological eco studies that we can find in the, lit in the scientific literature. Uh, however, it's, um, a com it's a composting worm, so uh, this species is not present in mineral soils where pesticides are applied. Um, and uh, based on a meta-analysis, we did a few years ago in 2013, um, yeah, 13, 
uh, and based on um, uh, all the literature what, what, that was available uh, on the LC50, which is a, uh, the lethal concentration to kill 50% of the individuals, we highlighted that Ezenia fetida was two times less sensitive than other earthworm species that can be found in the field. And it's uh, more than three times less sensitive than a, a, speci a earthworm species very frequent in uh, cultivated fields. So for my own research, I use, spe I use speci earthworm species that can be found in natural condition in agricultural fields. I work with natural soils and uh, with realistic concentration, including the recommended dose in uh, the fields. And I work with commercial f formulation, not uh, pure molecules, um, and mainly with uh, commercial formulation that are representative of the practices for cereal crops, so in arable fields, and that have potential effects taking into account the toxic reference values and the recommended dose. So I use this strategy to study the impact of, we can use this strategy to assess the impact of pesticides at different levels of biological organization, whatever it's in the lab or in the field. And I will show you, uh, I will give you a brief overview of the potential effect of pesticides at, dif at the different levels of organization. So first, some authors studied the impact at, on DNA damage, and they highlighted 97% um, uh, uh, more damage with um, chlorpyrifose pest uh, made the pesticide, which is it's a commercial formulation uh, uh, made of chlorpyrifose. It's an insecticide. And uh, so they found, in that case, uh, big, decree, big uh, DNA damage compared to the control uh, earthworm exposed to, to, to uh, soil without pesticide. Uh, you can see on that um, graph that, for instance, for glyphosate, there, there was no effect on DNA damage in, this, in that case. Secondly, you can have some effects at the cell level. Uh, for instance, some earthworms were exposed to opus, which is a a commercial formulation of uh, epoxyconazole, which is a fungicide, on the um, earthworm species Alolobophora icterica, which is a common species in, in the field. And we could find a uh, transitory effect on enzymatic activities, which is a cell defense toward oxidative stress um, when uh, the earthworms are exposed to, to pesticides and uh, along with a decrease in energy reserves. So we could highlight some effects at the cell level. And this effect at the gene and the cell level can have consequences at the individual level because it can divert the energy from the vital functions that the organism have to ensure. So uh, after an exposure to swing gold, which is a, a commercial formulation of a fungicide made of epoxyconazole and dimoxystrobine. Uh, we found some effects, some negative effect on the reproduction at the recommended dose because I, forget, I forgot to say that, but all that results were, were at recommend, the recommended dose in the field. So uh, we could find minus 35% of cocoons produced, so these are the eggs produced by earthworms. And so quite big effects on reproduction, and minus 20% of hatchlings. So uh, the cocoons can, uh, cannot hatch, so you don't have any newborns. And at three times the recommended dose, that is a realistic concentration because these molecules are quite persistent in the environment, we found minus 50% of cocoons produced, minus 33% of hatchlings, and the hatchlings needed five days more to hatch. We also uh, assessed the impact on the growth, and we could find uh, that the, um, the earthworm, the juveniles, needed nine, nine days more to become adults. So all these results can have, um, all these effects can have um, 
um, some consequences at the population level and the population dynamics. And uh, we used some uh, data from uh, organic and con conventional cropping systems. Um, we made the sample, the sample was sampling in loamy soils in France uh, with a neutral pH. Uh, all the plots were ploughed and uh, we were under winter wheat crop and they all the plots received the same time and the same proportion of organic inputs because it's important for earthworms. And we could, uh, we could, we highlighted um, a, a, neg a negative impact that an increase in the total TFI, which is a treatment frequency index, we use it as a pressure index. So an increase in the TFI led to a decrease in earthworm abundance for uh, three earthworm species commonly found in the field. And we uh, showed that the more an earthworm species lives near to the soil surface, the more it's affected by pesticide applications. So we used this, this mathematical relationship to predict the, the, the effect of a decrease um, of in the TFI as it was planned by the Ecofito plan. And we, we could have um, multiplied by four or by 1.5 the abundance of these three or some species uh, if the TFI is divided by two. Uh, final, uh, not finally, at the community level, uh, we can also highlight some uh, consequences of pesticides. For instance, uh, this, was, uh, this is a study that was done in uh, shaded coffee plots in uh, Mexico. And uh, so um, the, the, the white bar is a uh, with herbicide and mainly glyphosate. It was the, the main um, herbicide that was used in that trial. And the gray bar is without herbicide. So this study uh, sh sh showed that uh, the hormonant is higher without uh, glyphosate, without, with, without any herbicide than uh, with herbicides. So it, it was not the total community, the total um, abundance of earthworm. And finally, at the ecosystem level, uh, we can have uh, these authors found um, effect of imidacloprid, uh, form a commercial formulation of imidacloprid on uh, Aporitodea nocturna uh, at, the, at, re at a realistic concentration, and they found some effect on uh, earthworm behavior uh, that led to the effect on uh, soil structure, and uh, they found minus 40% of gas diffusion. So, um, Finally, as a conclusion, I would say that uh, we, c we cannot say that all the pesticides uh, have negative effects on earthworm, but we cannot say neither that the pesticides have no effect on earthworms because um, in my research and in the literature, um, we, found, uh, we can find some negative uh, effects of some pesticides commonly used in Europe at realistic concentration at recommended dose. So um, by chain reactions, all these effects at the different levels of biological organization can lead to uh, consequences on the ecosystem services and soil quality. And um, so I wanted to propose some lines of thought for risk assessment um, because we have, uh, there, there are some pre-registration procedures and in that, in that case, for my own research, I recommend to use um, um, representative and sensitive earthworm species. So we are working on pro some proposition for international norms uh, to work on species we can find in the field. And uh, we also recommend to work on uh, other relevant endpoints such as growth or behavior uh, that can um, um, have consequences on life cycle of uh, the, the species and the population dynamics that we can follow in the field. Um, for post-registration, uh, we recommend to increase the number of field studies uh, taking into account the confounding factors 
that we call the confounding factors, such as uh, ag other agricultural practices. And it's the way to, to, to pay attention to the effects of um, uh, mixture effects, because in the field you don't have just one pesticide or two, but um, uh, different kinds of pesticide acting at the same time. And uh, as well to work on the exposure of non-target organisms at the landscape scale, uh, taking into account the effects at higher trophic levels. So we are working on, a, on some projects in landscape ecotoxicology to assess uh, how the landscape uh, con composition and configuration can um, uh, influence the, the fate and the effects of pesticides in agricultural landscapes. So um, um, I thank you for your attention, and I just wanted to finish with a, a quote of Charles Darwin, who was uh, really keen on earthworms. He, said, he wrote, without the work of this humble creature, who knows nothing about the benefits it confers uh, upon mankind, agriculture as we know it would be very difficult, if not wholly impossible, and I would say not sustainable. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I think for me, and I've been involved in soil work for 20-something years, actually 40-something years, that's been an extremely important paper in opening my mind to another dimension. But I'm going to open your mind, and I'm going to invite the opening of our minds to a further dimension, and that's dealing with soil bacteria and fungi, and that's uh, Fabrice Martin Laurent. Fabrice, also from INRA. Yes. The floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you, Michael, for the introduction, and thank you uh, uh, for the uh, invitation to speak. Can you hear me? Yes? Yeah. So uh, today we speak about uh, pesticide effect on soil microorganisms, and so uh, we start my talk as uh, Lucas said, and uh, as Céline said also, so soil is not uh, only the support of the culture, or it's also a living organism, as, uh, as we can say. So it, it represents a, a, an ecological niche in which a huge diversity is hosted, and uh, among the organisms living in soil, microorganisms are uh, numerous. As you can see, in one gram of soil, this small tube, uh, containing one gram of soil, you can find up to one billion of bacteria and uh, one million of species of bacteria. And uh, you got also a huge uh, diversity of fungal species on the, on the left-hand side. And all these uh, microorganisms are forming a microbial biomass in soil. And, uh, for example, for bacteria, it's estimated to 1,500 tons per hectare. It's really a, a, a big amount. So they are there, they are numerous, and, um, and uh, they are representing a huge diversity, but uh, they are also playing functions, and uh, they are key drivers of uh, a number of uh, soil ecosystemic services, among which nutrient cycling, for example, or uh, water purification, if we are speaking about uh, pesticides. So they are playing uh, a, a role in the quality of the environments. Although we know that they, they are there, so they are, they are diverse, present in abundance, and uh, presenting activities, contributing to soil ecosystemic services, they are under um, pressure, anthropic <coughs> pressure, among which we can uh, see, soil usage and agricultural practices may have a, a clear uh, and strong effect on uh, the, uh, their diversity, abundance and activity, and as a consequence, they may change the level of uh, services they support. This is ongoing within the context of the global change, and although we know that they are important, 
there are still the poor, par the poor parents from the regulatory point of view. For example, there are no regulatory requirements for post-registration assessment of pesticide effects on soil microorganisms. I would say because of the absence of soil protection directive, although it has been proposed uh, almost uh, 10 years ago uh, to the European Parliament, and if we consider the, the pre-registration uh, evaluation of environmental risk assessment of pesticide, there is only one measurement that is done, uh, and uh, it is related to the evaluation of the effect of pesticide on the mineralization of nitrogen and carbon. And these uh, two tests are global tests that are not sensitive enough to estimate the ecotoxicological impact of pesticide on microbial communities and on the functions that uh, support soil ecosystemic services. This is the situation now, but what we can say also is that there are uh, plenty of work that are ongoing uh, to uh, propose uh, new uh, ways to estimate the uh, risk for, uh, for soil microorganisms uh, exposed to pesticide. And for example, in 2010, EFSA published a scientific opinion uh, proposing to, um, to uh, the, to follow as a specific protection goals soil ecosystemic services for environmental risk assessment of pesticide. And uh, within this uh, scientific opinion, microorganisms are, uh, have been identified. Oh, sorry, because I'm moving my slides, but not in on the computer. <laughs> uh, okay, where am I? Oh, sorry. Okay, I'm here. Um, so <laughs> So because it was moving on my computer and not on the screen, so I have to follow the two screens on that. So EFSA proposed to, um, to as a specific protection goals, environmental, uh, uh, within the environmental risk assessment, uh, they propose to follow soil ecosystemic services. And uh, they propose also, they identify soil microorganisms as uh, key factors to be protected considering functional groups. Okay, thank you. So, um, in 2006, they published another scientific opinion and they proposed to include ecological recovery uh, concept in environmental risk assessment of pesticide. And uh, within this, uh, this concept, uh, they propose also uh, to uh, define normal operating range for each key factor to, put, to be protected, including soil microorganisms. And lastly, last year, the, another scientific <laughs> opinion was uh, uh, published and uh, in which a series of standardized methods for uh, pesticide risk assessment uh, on in soil living uh, <laughs> organisms have been published and for microbes uh, to uh, kind of, uh, of target have been identified, uh, the one that are involved in nitrogen cycle in soil and the one involved in the uh, endomycorrhizal symbiosis form with most of the of plant species. So although uh, all this work has been done, there are a, a lot of uh, challenges to be tackled uh, because in fact we don't know, uh, we don't know yet what uh, are the target to be followed, which microbial functions and corresponding proxies have to be evaluated. It's still a question. For each function, nutrient cycling or water purification, which att attributes do, do we have to follow? Uh, we need more basic knowledge, genes and enzymes involved in, in this uh, function. And we, as it was mentioned at, uh, by EFSA, we also need to define the normal operating range for each of the attributes measured in a given uh, context. And this list is uh, not exhaustive. Many challenges have to be tackled. So within this uh, context, thank you, <laughs> um, microbial ecotoxicology emerged 
This discipline is uh, aiming to uh, study the effect of pollutants on the ecosystem and uh, the effect of pollutants on uh, microbial, of microbial species and uh, the interaction between microbial species and pollutants. And there are two, mm, two main que questions to, to be addressed. The, the first one is to uh, assess the impact of pesticide on, on microorganisms and on supported function. And uh, the second one is to understand the role of microorganisms and of microbial function on the fate of pesticides. Next slide. So now I will present you uh, some results uh, on uh, advanced researches on risk assessment of pesticide on soil microorganisms. On soil microorganisms. As you understood, we still uh, have to work on it uh, in order to be able to propose uh, methods readily applicable to, um, to uh, estimate the effect of uh, pesticide on uh, soil, on soil, uh, on soil microbial function uh, going on on soil. So I will present you some results uh, coming out from a, an EU project that I have been coordinated. Uh, this ECOFUND microbiotic project was aiming to uh, develop and evaluate uh, innovative tool to assess the impact of pesticide on soil functional uh, microbial diversity. So to do so, we set up uh, uh, two tire experiments. The first, uh, the tire two experiment was uh, uh, similar to the type of uh, uh, experiment that uh, Céline was uh, presenting. So it's, it's field experiment. It was done in Serbia um, uh, using uh, the recommended dose. And uh, this was uh, with, a, uh, with a, a pesticide uh, in, in its uh, commercial form. So we put three, three treatments, uh, one time, two time, and five time the recommended dose. And we include this uh, in this experiment control plot. And the idea was to measure the toxicity of this, uh, the application of the pesticide. So the pesticide applied was a sulfony urea herbicide, nicosulfuron, used to control annual grass uh, in maize. And uh, the target of this uh, pesticide is uh, an enzyme involved in the biosynthesis of uh, uh, amino acid. So we, we put uh, also a, la uh, a lab experiment, a tire one, we, which is the worst case scenario, uh, in which we are not anymore at the recommended dose, but at uh, higher level. Uh, it's really to test uh, the toxicity uh, of, the, uh, of the pesticide under the worst case scenario. So this was done on the same soil the Serbian soil, but in France. Starting from this uh, material, uh, we, have, we have done several experiments to assess the, uh, the uh, interest of uh, several ISO standards for, to estimate pesticide toxicity to soil microorganisms. So as an example, we study the effect on, of the pesticide application on the abundance diversity and activity uh, using ISO standards, but also what we did, we uh, used a method that are based on soil DNA extraction that has been developed in our laboratory, but now it's an ISO standard. And based on the, this uh, soil DNA extraction, we are able to quantify microbial groups uh, that are in the soil uh, using qPCR analysis. And so this is an ISO standard now, the 17601. And uh, we applied also sequencing analysis of the DNA uh, to target specific microbial groups. And uh, also we test and develop new methods uh, targeting uh, speci specific microbial groups, among which are buscular mycorrhiza that are forming symbiosis with plants and uh, uh, microbes uh, involved in nitrogen cycle, microbes also uh, tolerant to uh, nicosulfuron. 
So the first thing when you have to, when you want to evaluate the pesticide effect on uh, in soil organisms, uh, on, on microorganisms living in soil, you have to uh, monitor uh, the, the fate of the pesticide. So it's what we did here. So you can see that in the tier two uh, scenario, the field X, you can see a clear uh, dissipation of the pesticide within uh, 10 days almost 80 percent of the uh, pesticide was dissipated in the tire one scenario the worst case scenario it was totally the opposite in the uh, during the first cycle we can see a dissipation like it was observed in the tire two scenario but Along the, 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 the culture cycle, uh, cycle three, four, and five, you can see clearly an accumulation of pesticide residues in soil. So we have a contra contrasted scenario of exposure. On one end, dissipation. On the other end, accumulation. So uh, I will just show you briefly a few results because there are many of the results, but here, for example, uh, in the tier two scenario, uh, we can see a significant increase in the phosphatase activity involved in the uh, phosphate uh, solubility in soil, and a significant decrease in cellobio hydrolase involved in carbon cycle in the soil. And this, uh, these uh, changes were only transient, and the recovery was observed after 50 days of exposure. On the contrary, if you, on this slide, you can see the diversity of uh, bacteria able to, uh, to, to resist to, uh, to nicosulfuron. And what we can, uh, we can see is that uh, in soil exposed to nicosulfuron, uh, you got an increase, a significant increase uh, in the diversity of, of these bacteria able to resist to nicosulfuron. So there is a clear uh, trend to uh, the increase uh, uh, in the resistance when uh, th there, there is an exposure to the nicosulfuron. Next slide. The last thing I will show you about the result is the uh, shift in the bacterial community that are able to uh, resist to uh, nicosulfuron. We can see, and this was done uh, in the lab experiment, you can see that the control in red was clearly, community was clearly d different from the blue one, uh, the community exposed to uh, nicosulfuron. This was uh, at uh, T2, so the second cycle of culture, and the same trend was observed at T4. Next slide. So to sum up the, 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 this result, so we, we follow the number of attributes, and what we can see is that uh, in the field, field exp, almost all uh, the attributes were not responsive to, to the pesticide, except for uh, the symbiosis, uh, with uh, uh, arbuscular mycorrhiza and for uh, the, the uh, bacteria resistant, tolerant to uh, nicosulfuron. On the contrary, uh, in the tier one scenario, where the worst case scenario, almost all the, 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 the tests were positive, were positive, so affected by uh, uh, pesticide exposure. So, as we can see from this work, there is a, 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 there are a range of uh, indicators that can possibly be used to estimate the effect of pesticide on soil microorganisms. And uh, at ISO, uh, International Standard Organization, there, is, uh, there are ongoing work to uh, establish new standards on to, is to measure the activity of soil microorganisms, but also the abundance and the diversity. And ongoing work at ISO is uh, um, done to establish a list of criteria for the selection of indicators for microbial function 
functional indicators, new one, and to identify the most suitable function, functional indicators uh, in soil microbiology. Uh, this is done uh, with the aim to develop a package of uh, standards to measure the abundance, diversity, and activity of functional guilds uh, supporting soil ecosystemic uh, uh, services uh, to monitor their response in, uh, to various stressors, including pesticides. And within this context, uh, we just deposit a, a new EU project called Renovet. Uh, this project is coordinated by Professor Dimitrios Kaposas. He was involved in the uh, Ecofund Microbative project. And this the uh, project is aiming to, uh, to develop a research and training network for advanced assessment of the ecotoxicity of pesticide on soil microorganisms in Europe. So I would like to thank you for, for your attention. I'm going to open it to the floor, but beforehand, I ask Pavel to make some comments. But I think it's fair to say that we've got a global picture, and we've got a more focused picture with relation to earthworms and uh, bacteria and fungi. On soil and arable crops make up 50% of the land of the EU. So let's think about the importance of that. Pavel. Yes, thank you, Michael. I have quite two things. First, to say a remark which will make probably this picture even more darker, and second, as a question. So, first remark um, uh, we are now working on implementation reports on plant protection product regulation. So, we are after the first two rounds of, of research on this topic. And one of the darker uh, pictures is that uh, never during the authorization process. A ecotoxicology data are acquired, never. Because on a European level is where is assessed active compound um, during authorization process uh, is mostly a, so industrial science used and without ecotoxicology data, which is supposed to be uh, assessed somehow during authorization uh, uh, procedures on, on formulations which is or supposed to be done on member state level. Uh, but after uh, uh, first findings on this, uh, member states are confirming that they don't have from the industry any ecotoxicology data. Uh, so during all the authorization process on European level and on the member state level is never assessed uh, ecotoxicology data on, 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 um, on, uh, on pesticides. Just to uh, say what we are assessed, I propose to assess uh, uh, five uh, compounds. First is, of course, glyphosate. Second one is 2,4-D. Uh, then bentazone, uh, one of neonic neonicotinoid family, and uh, 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 benzotiostrobin, which is apparent why. So this is a remark, and then questions to, to all, uh, to, to both uh, last uh, speakers. When, when we imagine, and you will uh, for sure know f about which compound I'm speaking, when we have a, a active compound which is, which, which, uh, has, uh, uh, which is blocking Shikimat pathway, uh, synthesis of, of, of tryptophan, um, uh, it is, in fact, uh, not only in plants, it's also in bacteria present, this, this metabolic pathway. Mm -hmm. uh, so this compound is, in fact, antibiotic. Uh, it was also patented as an antibiotic. I'm, of course, speaking about glyphosate. It's, it's apparent. So uh, wh how, would, how would you uh, judge uh, the situation when we are spraying uh, uh, our soil with antibiotic? How it will, how it will uh, affect uh, soil microbiome. What would you judge on this? What, you, what would you tell us about this? Thank you. I, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> for both. Yeah, for both. So, um, Nico Sufur, I, I won't say, I, I will answer to the Shikimat pathway, and to, which is glyphosate, in fact. Mm -hmm. um, 
But so for the study I show you, nicosulfuron is uh, inhibiting uh, acetohydroxysynthase. So this is the target in plant, but uh, I did not mention it, but 80% of the soil microorganisms have this uh, gene in their, uh, yeah. in their chromosome. So uh, as, you, as, you, as you can say, in the regulation, they are considered a, 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 as non-target organisms. But from the bio biological point of view, these non-target uh, organisms are having in their, their genetic background the target. So uh, this, is, this was an introduction to the question you, you raised. So for the Shikimat pathway and for this glyphosate story, I would say that I don't know if uh, the patent of glyphosate was deposited as an antibiotic. But what I know is that uh, there is a recent paper uh, that was published by uh, American colleague showing that uh, following repeated exposure to uh, glyphosate, they can see an emergence of antibiotic uh, resistance uh, in several bacteria. Uh, in this paper, they did not discuss this, uh, the result um, in the way that glyphosate was an antibiotic, but they were explaining uh, the story by the fact that, uh, in fact, uh, the, the process of the emergence of this antibiotic resistance was due to the fact that uh, the processes, the biological processes to, uh, to deal with the glyphosate was similar to the processes to deal with antibiotic. So, in fact, it was a pump. The, this pump was uh, pumping out the glyphosate from, from the cells, but they were not uh, at any uh, point of the discussion uh, referring to the fact that uh, glyphosate was an antibiotic. So, uh, voilà. But, but uh, it's what I can say on this. Uh, but I have never seen, I never, I've never seen this patent, uh, but... Okay, I got it. <laughs> so, okay. Now you have seen it. <laughs> yeah, I've seen it. So, uh, if, it's, uh, if it's registered as a patent, I would say, uh, as, as, a, as an antibiotic, I would say this, uh, this can be a, this raises the question of antibiotic resistant emergence. And this is also the same for the use of veterinary antibiotics. So, for example, at the moment, I've got a, a big project on that in which we are uh, studying the emergence of uh, antibiotic resistance to uh, veterinary antibiotics that, are, uh, they, that can be found in the soil or in the water, in, in wastewater, notably. And so, and, okay, I will stop here. So. Thank you. Um, thank you for uh, this question. So, um, personally, I've never worked on antibiotics, and I've never studied the impact of antibiotics on earthworms or other uh, soil organisms. But I know that, for instance, in the context of organic waste, uh, the use of organic wastes, uh, there, there, there is a, an important question. There are some antibiotics in, in, the, in, this, in the context of pesticides as well. So... Um, uh, we know that, uh, I know that there is not a lot of uh, liter scientific literature on the effect of antibiotics on uh, soil fauna. And uh, what is um, funny is that uh, when I read the book of uh, Rachel Carson, uh, Silent Spring, I, I found a, a piece of uh, an article from a newspaper uh, from in the, the 60s. And the um, antibiotics were considered as uh, emergent contaminants. As they, are, as they are still hard. They are still considered as an emergent contaminant. So I think we have uh, many questions to, to, to answer concerning antibiotics. Okay, let's, um, let's widen it out. The floor has had its say. Over to you. Your name, rank, serial number, those kind of things. <laughs> so I, I'm Paul Leonard, I work for BASF, and uh, by the way, we're members of the IBMA as well. Um, so I had, first of all, a clarification, because I think, um, if I understood you correctly, uh, Mr. Potts, you were talking about the 
ecotoxicology in soil organisms because, of course, the ecotoxicology dossier for plant protection products is extensive. It covers thousands of pages and a wide range of organisms. And uh, many of my good colleagues, I have 100 colleagues working purely on ecotox uh, dossiers in Limburgerhof and, and as many, again, in outside organizations. This is probably the most challenging part of any dossier that's used to support a crop protection product. So I'd hate anybody to leave this room with the misapprehension that we don't need ecotoxicology data to approve crop protection products. It's, it's absolutely the, at the heart of the dossier. And I'm very happy to, to explain that or put you in touch with my, with my expert colleagues if you'd like to find out more about it. But I had a question as well, which is um, uh, to Celine uh, Rolossi. Have you looked at the or compared the impact of, um, of the pesticides that you looked at in soil on, on earthworm behavior with the effects of, for example, deep furrow, furrow plowing. Um, I recently visited uh, the Game Conservancy Council in the UK, and I was really surprised to see that in, in, in one study they showed me it took six years for earthworm uh, burrow densities to return to normal uh, pre-plowing levels following deep furrow plowing. Sorry, yeah, so um, the, um, we've, there are lots of uh, articles on the effect of plowing on earthworms, and it's a huge impact. So because it, there are mechanical, uh, me mechanical damages and many different effects. So after, uh, when you stop plowing, you can have a quiet, um, fast recovery of earthworms. After two or three years, you can have a community that increase. It's, it's a little bit different after pesticides because uh, of the, um, the, the remaining molecules in the soil. And we noticed in one study I conducted that we need more than 10 years to, to recover uh, the community, you know, for some species to, to come back to the fields and to, to, for the population dynamics to, to, to be good. But the regulation requires recovery within one year or you can't register the product at, at, in terms of field evidence. If you have an impact on earthworms after one year, you can't register the product based on field trial evidence. Yes, but in the regulation, I think that is just one molecule. And uh, so in the field, it's different because you, uh, if you have some impact on, of uh, one chemical on or some community, um, you will have other molecules probably used uh, the same year on the same crop. So uh, the recovery could be more difficult uh, than if you just have one application of one chemical. Sir. Yeah, my name is uh, Piet Bodekamp from uh, Artemis uh, Netherlands, the Dutch IBMA. I have a similar question. You did a lot of studies with PPP on uh, DNA cell and the population level of earthworms. And I wonder if you stop really with applying in your experiments, how soon will the recovery be? Or did you never did those studies? If I study the recovery myself. Yeah, the recovery, yeah. just stopping with applying and you monitor the yes. fields again and do it come back to a normal level and yeah. how long does it take? Uh, in, in fact, we have a semi-field uh, yeah. condition uh, trial mm -hmm. because we worked in a fallow that has, did not that has not received any pesticide for more than 20 years. And we test uh, two, an organic and um, an inorganic, it's copper made uh, mm. uh, pesticide, and an organic uh, pesticide. And we followed the community after one month, six months, 12, 18, and 24 months. So um, we had a big effect of uh, one uh, pesticide. And we, are, we follow, we are assessing the recovery. And we notice that some pesticides uh, uh, have effects um, more, after more than 20, 12 months. Yeah, okay. yeah. And uh, there are some effects as well on the functions. Because we are assessing um, soil functionings in terms of organic matter degradation and the soil structure. And uh, so we will see if we have uh, effects, but I think that because we lost big earthworms after, and we had some effect after 12 months, so we will see if we have some effects on the macro porosity uh, that mm. is done by these earthworms. And we, um, we 
also uh, followed the community in a um, trial that stopped using pesticide in, two, in um, 1998. And we made some samples in, um, after 10 years of differentiation of the systems. And couldn't, we couldn't see any, any difference between the conventional system and the organic system after 10 years. And I came back when I was hired in Versailles, and after 15 years, it was totally different. Because uh, I don't know why exactly, but my feeling is that, uh, and it's published, it's because um, there are... Um, a remanence of uh, persistence of some, of some pesticides because uh, in 1998 some pesticides were quite harmful for uh, uh, soil organisms and the, 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 the frequency and was not the same. They were uh, um, used uh, more, uh, uh, yeah. And um, as well, the rotation has changed so probably with more um, um, legumes, there were more legumes in the rotation. So it's not just about pesticides, it's all the cropping system that was changed. But um, uh, some species uh, came back in the fields and we couldn't see them in, after 10 years of differentiation, just after 15 years. So it's long. I think that when you stop uh, using pesticides, it's long, quite long to recover the community. You're welcome. I, I, I'll take um, another couple of questions if, if, if they're necessary. Yes, please. And um, I'm, I'm just going to give about five more minutes on this and then I'm moving on to the next uh, subject. So short and sharp, no speeches, please. I have a very uh, sharp question. I'm representing a Polish magazine about health and allergies. I would like to address the question because we were discussing about uh, earthworms, about losing microorganisms uh, and also losing biodiversity. But what about health consequences that people are missing microelements, also nutrition, because the soil is getting weaker and weaker. And those are financial uh, consequences also about uh, making research and all the um, I would say checkups that has to be done. It's very costly. Who will cover the cost of, uh, let's say, reversing uh, the pesticides consequences? And shouldn't this be like in Sweden that uh, pesticides usage is very highly taxed and then farmers are very financially motivated to use bio-pesticides? Is this, this a solution? Anybody want to take that? Luca. <laughs> That's a, a sweeve, as we say, when we don't understand what the answer is. But I think I take your point that uh, if there are effects, who pays the effects? Let me uh, ask for other, other comments, other uh, questions. Yeah. Um, Evelyn Underwood, um, Institute for European Environmental Policy. Um, first <coughs> question for the JRC. Um, I know that in 2013, you published the first estimate, attempt to estimate the status of soil biodiversity in Europe um, using a sort of expert scoring approach and then mapping indirect proxies. Um, I'd, I'd be interested to know if you're going to uh, make any further attempts in that direction, if you've made, you know, are thinking of any other approaches. And then for Claudia Pelosi, um, I don't know if this is something you know about, but I'd be interested in when whether you see a potential in the kind of citizen science approach of asking people to dig a hole and look at the earthworms and to count how many blue ones there are and green ones and so on. Is that a feasible way of assessing impacts on soil biodiversity? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. Yes, indeed, in 2011 we were still stuck with estimates and guesstimates. But um, what we have decided is that in the next, actually this year's Lucas Soil Survey, we will have um, a real field observation consistently all over EU of soil biodiversity. What we will do is we have already financed and put it into the, the, the program that in 2000, the 2018 survey will include measurements uh, on um, on what was just presented on metagenomics of soil so that we will have 
uh, DNA extraction and measurements consistently on soils collected over the 28 member states. And this maybe will allow us uh, for the first time to have, as I was saying, uh, a reality check on what is the status across the EU on soil biodiversity. Because as you rightly mentioned, the difficulty is always to get consistent data and to get away from estimates, guesstimates, and perceptions and go to actual measurements and be able to make a statement about the state of soil biodiversity in Europe based on actual observations. But this will be done this year. Of course, the result will not come out this year because this year we do the sampling and then the analysis. I suspect you will get a final answer probably end of 2019 where we will release the results of the 2018 survey. Uh, yes, it's already done. In front, there is an, an initiative um, coming from uh, Brittany uh, for um, to um, involve the people in uh, the assessment of earthworms in the different types of ecosystems. So, for farmers in the field or for uh, everybody in their garden. So they use mustard and they just dig. <laughs> just to assess if they... So there is a big database now gathering all these results, but uh, sometimes it's tricky because um, we can ask uh, some question about the relevancy of the results because the methodology must be the same and sometimes it's not uh, done the same way. Okay, I, I want to ask one last question myself, and that is to, to bring you back to the reality of... Uh, our arable farming in Europe. Our arable farming in Europe, as I said, takes up about ha half the land, more or less, and it's continuous, so it takes place year upon year upon year. Now, in the experimental work that you've described, of course you're dealing with one year, but the reality of agriculture is continuous use. It's been there for forever, I guess. Or, and we also know that I think from your work, Luca, many years ago, that soil, by, soil organic content in European arable soils is quite considerably lower than that in other soils. We know some of the reasons. But is there a way of making a link between the reality of the way we farm and the reality of what that entails and the what appears, at least from what you've said, I think, to be a weakening of the dynamic of soil in terms of its ability to retain organic matter, in its ability to uh, retain a good structure, in its ability to absorb water, all those things that everybody knows and I forget. Each one of you, 30 seconds. You. Yeah, well, you know I love reality, so for sure a uh, reality check would be very interesting. The big question to me is, is um, if you want to keep your soils alive, uh, you need to, to take care of the life in soil. Now, of course, as you say, uh, the, the agriculture has been always been based on, on plowing, on uh, certain practices that are, are well established and are well functioning. Um, but if you look for alternatives, then you must uh, be sure that you don't have trade-offs on the other side. So um, I'm not completely sure that many of the other alternative methods will bring um, uh, benefits. But as you say, um, uh, there is definitely a lower soil organic carbon level in European soils uh, due to, to, to mineralization of carbon due to, to, to soil disturbance. Um, there are many advocates for alternative methods, so zero tillage, reduced tillage. Um, there, there are many things you can do. Um, but again, I, I would really like to somehow get first a full assessment of where are we with soil biodiversity. And once we will have data that will show that it's exactly there where we probably have more intensive agriculture that we have less, then maybe we can draw some conclusions. I'm not, not prepared really to say more than that. but. Certainly, I'm convinced that we need to keep the soils alive, not only because it's nice, but also because they perform functions, uh, the carbon cycle, but also the nitrate cycle. There are many things that are fundamental to keep alive. But you can do farming on sterile materials if you want, 
but it's not really, I think, what people would be very keen to hear. Okay. Yes. Uh, what I said that one point of my talk is that we need, we need to, uh, to have normal operating range, and I think that uh, this is uh, really the, the truth. So we need to have more data to uh, establish this normal op operating range on various bioindicators that can be used as proxies of uh, soil functioning. And uh, somehow we have to establish values for, I would not say each soil type, but I would say a range of soil types in which we can have values, like for your blood analysis, for example, saying that, okay, you, this value is, is okay, you can maybe uh, grow uh, with and apply this pesticide without any problem, or don't apply this pesticide because the value is too low and you, you have to go for biocontrol, for example. So we have to have more data and, and establish this normal operating range to have a kind of uh, monitoring program to, uh, to help the uh, farmers to decide on which crop to go and how to organize their farming uh, uh, procedures. Sorry, the last, the last point, the earthworms, as it were. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. So um, I would say that we need in natura data, as my colleagues. I think it's very important to know uh, what happened in the field, uh, considering uh, not only pesticides, but all the wall cropping systems, and not just uh, one practice or another one, and uh, so we need uh, biomonitoring procedures. I think that one solution could be uh, for pest to, to assess the pesticides potential effect would be uh, to, to study the fate and the exposure of living organisms. So because it's very difficult to, to assess the effects properly in the field because of uh, different factors interacting at the same time, I think exposure could be a good way to, to have an idea or if, of uh, the potential effects. Okay, let's, uh, let's finish at that. I want to thank the three speakers. Pavel, first. Yeah, I would like also to, to, to thank, thank to the speakers, and I have to apologize because I have uh, another commitment, so I hope to be back uh, at the last panel, and now I have to go. So I'm not abandoning you, I'm leaving you only. Okay, we expect you back. Uh, I want to thank the three speakers. I want you to thank the three speakers. They have opened up, I think, for me, the crucial element in relation to... Uh, the baseline for IPM. For me, they've opened up uh, a new vision of the challenges that we face. I readily admit that caution and the need for more research were not far behind what they said, but researchers say those kind of things. Um, people in the policy world have to uh, sometimes do other things. So thank you very much, and uh, could I ask the next group of speakers to come to the floor? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, 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 absolutely. This is my victory. <laughs> You're the next group after this. You're not this one. Huh? You're not this one. The next one. No, you're the next one. You're the last group. And what do they have now? Uh, two farmers. Ah. So you should be listening to two farmers. How are you? I'll talk to you after.
<laughs> I see you in a few minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I'm perfect. It might, it might be that I will not be able to 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 be okay. 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 If it's case, just okay. Say hello. I understand. Okay. You're the main man. Oui, je suis le l'homme le plus important pour l'instant. Okay, ça va. <laughs> okay, let's um. Let's uh, let those people who are about to have a coffee have their coffee, but the rest of us, are, we're back in business again. Um, and we're going to the second session. We, we've dealt with soil. We've dealt, we haven't no answered problems, but we've dealt with it. And we now move to the challenge, if you get soil right, of mainstreaming IPM into arable farming. And what can be done now. And the approach that the organizers have taken is to get two producers to give us their experiences, <clears throat> one producer from France, the other producer from Italy. Both of them are playing rugby at the weekend, but so is my country, so I'm not taking sides for either of them. So let's start, nevertheless, with La Belle France, because France plays Ireland on Saturday. So. It's up to you. You've got about 15 minutes or so. I'm not going to be too strict, but nevertheless, I expect to score a couple of tries against you. Off you go. This is Jean-Bernard Lozier. Merci. Je, malheureusement, je pense que vous allez gagner contre nous samedi, oui. Mais c'est pas grave. On fera mieux l'année prochaine. Donc euh, bonjour, euh, donc je suis euh, Jean-Bernard Lozier, je suis agriculteur euh, en France, euh, au sud de, de la Normandie, à 100 km à l'ouest de Paris, euh, sur un plateau céréalier euh, type euh, bassin parisien. C'est un plateau de limon moyen, on va dire, euh, avec un potentiel de rendement en blé de 80 quintaux. Euh, C'est un climat donc euh, de type océanique avec euh, euh, 600 mm de pluie environ par an avec euh, un, un, un problème de, de, au mois de juin, de sécheresse de mois de juin. Mais voilà. Euh, C'est un paysage de plateau. Euh, je, je, je peux avoir le. Voilà, ça marche comment ah, oui. Voilà. Euh, c'est un paysage de plateau semi-ouvert, donc c'est de l'open field, mais avec des bosquets un peu répartis un peu partout. Euh, donc je, mais, mais les terres que je cultive sont toutes sur des bassins d'alimentation de captage en eau, donc avec une grosse problématique de pollution des, des captages. Euh, donc je me suis installé en 1990 euh, sur euh, une partie de l'exploitation familiale sur 40 hectares. Euh, Aujourd'hui, je cultive 80 hectares. Euh, donc à mon installation, je me suis installé avec un... J'avais aussi un élevage de volailles en vente directe et, bon, que j'ai abandonné et que j'ai transmis à une, à une nièce. Donc les... Les premières années de 90 à 97, euh, j'ai en fait euh, j'étais un peu noyé sous les emprunts. quoi. C'était une installation, donc euh, on essaye de pas trop bouger, de faire un peu comme tout le monde. Et euh, donc je, je faisais un système tout à fait euh, classique euh, du, de la région, avec une rotation sur trois euh, ans, euh, colza, blé et orge, donc que des cultures d'hiver, avec euh, à la marge un peu de un peu de, de poids protéagineux, mais c'est bon, c'était un peu, c'était vraiment à la marge. Euh, alors c'est vrai que j'avais toujours, moi j'ai toujours eu une, une sensibilité environnementale, on va dire. J'étais, mais euh, euh, sur les premières années, la, les problèmes économiques étaient plus forts que, les, que la sensibilité environnementale. En, en 1997. Euh, euh, bon, les, les, le cours du blé n'était pas très bon. Moi, j'allais un peu mieux parce que j'avais déjà sept, ans, sept années de recul. Euh, donc, j'ai décidé de, de, de partir sur un système de technique culturelle simplifiée 
On peut dire que c'était les prémices de ce qu'on appelle en France l'agriculture de conservation, c'est-à-dire une agriculture où on ne laboure plus, on travaille superficiellement, voire pas du tout les sols, et on essaye de couvrir les sols le plus possible. Euh, la démarche, c'était euh, prioritairement de réduire les charges, les charges de structure les, 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 et le, et le temps de travail aussi, et, et accessoirement, euh, c'était de recréer aussi de la vie du sol, arrêter ce labour qui, nous disait-on, euh, tuait les vers de terre, on en a parlé tout à l'heure, euh, et puis, euh, et puis euh, avait une incidence très négative sur la vie du sol. Euh, le problème, c'est qu'au bout de trois ans, euh, n'ayant rien changé d'autre que le travail du sol, euh, ben je me suis aperçu que j'allais avoir un gros gros problème de gestion des adventices, des mauvaises herbes. Et, euh, et du coup, euh, coup j'allais... Euh, et en plus, oui, c'est ça. Et en plus, j'étais, du fait du, du non-labour, j'étais devenu très très dépendant du glyphosate. Et... Moi, déjà, à l'époque, euh, euh, ça me gênait un peu d'avoir un système de production qui était basé sur l'utilisation du glyphosate, en fait. Parce que ce système-là, euh, si on m'enlevait le glyphosate, il ne pouvait plus marcher. Et même avec le glyphosate, j'avais un gros problème de gestion des adventices. Et donc, euh, l'année 2000, euh, ont été mis en place, euh, alors en France, en Europe peut-être aussi, les euh, contrats territoriaux d'exploitation. C'est-à-dire que c'était un engagement de l'agriculteur euh, sur des euh, pratiques plus vertueuses en termes d'environnement, en contrepartie de quoi on avait euh, des aides euh, financières non négligeables, très intéressantes. Et, euh, et, et du coup, moi, je me suis dit, ben voilà, là, c'est peut-être une solution. Euh, c'est peut-être une solution, c'est-à-dire que euh, je, je, je vais peut-être pouvoir euh, allier euh, et l'économie et l'environnement, et, euh, et en, en gros, euh, euh, être plus dans un système de développement durable, on va dire. Et donc, euh, et donc euh, dans le même temps, s'est créé sur le département de l'Eure, dans lequel je suis, euh, un groupe d'agriculteurs de, de, qui euh, souhaitaient travailler, euh, mettre en pratique euh, ce qu'on appelle l'agriculture intégrée, euh, les principes de l'agriculture intégrée. Donc là, euh, Bon, opportunité, grosse opportunité, moi ça allait bien, je pouvais allier et l'économique et l'environnemental le, et, euh, et un travail de groupe aussi. Quoi. Et donc à partir de là, j'ai commencé, on a commencé, hein, et, euh, parce que alors, ce qui a été très important, c'est le travail de groupe. Hein, je, là, là-dessus, j'insiste beaucoup, c'est vraiment un travail où, euh, enfin, pour, pour euh, évoluer vers des nouvelles pratiques, le travail en groupe est primordial. Euh, nous, on a un travail, c'est vrai, où on est assez souvent seul dans notre tracteur. Alors bon, maintenant, on a 10 heures, donc on est arrivé à avoir de la musique et de la radio, mais, mais on est quand même tout seul. Et, et, et le fait de travailler en groupe, ça nous permet de beaucoup échanger et d'avancer de, et de, et, et éventuellement plus vite. Quoi. Et donc, depuis 2000, et bien, en fait, ça n'a été que que de l'évolution, que de l'adaptation, parce que je pense quand même qu'on a quand même pas mal débroussaillé euh, toutes ces notions d'agriculture intégrée, hein, qui étaient quand même assez vagues et pas tellement mises en pratique. On n'avait pas tellement d'exemples. De, de, euh, c'est un peu nous qui avons, qu avons essuyé les plâtres, j'ai envie de dire. Et c'est vrai que les premières années, en fait, on a fait, par exemple, du blé intégré. Aujourd'hui, quand je... Quand je quand je vois ça avec le recul que j'ai aujourd'hui, je me dis bah, c'est de la rigolade. Quoi. Faire que du blé intégré, ça ne peut pas marcher. Quoi. Et donc rapidement, nous, on s'est aperçu qu'il fallait travailler au niveau du système, de notre système de culture, de notre système d'exploitation. Et, euh, et donc on a essayé de mettre en, en place des, des stratégies de conduite des cultures euh, par rapport à la gestion des adventices et par rapport à la gestion... Euh, des maladies et des insectes. Alors après, euh, alors le, le premier gros levier qu'il fallait changer, c'était la rotation. En fait, euh, c'est vraiment la base. Euh, allonger les rotations, avoir des nouvelles familles de cultures, de façon à, à, à perturber un peu le, 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 
comment, la vie des, euh, des, des prédateurs, des, des maladies, des maladies cryptogamiques euh, et des mauvaises herbes aussi. Donc une rotation beaucoup plus longue avec une alternance de cultures d'hiver et de printemps. Et euh, donc, euh, si vous voulez, donc je vous disais tout à l'heure, moi, sur ce plateau là où je suis, c'est colza, blé, orge, en gros, trois cultures d'hiver. Euh, moi, j'ai une rotation sur neuf ans avec euh, du colza, de blé, de, du blé de l'orge, mais aussi du lin, du lin textile de printemps, de l'orge de printemps, du... Euh, du, de, des pois de printemps, euh, euh, du blé quand même, euh, parce que alors ça, ça, ça fait partie des choses qui étaient très compliquées pour moi, parce que euh, moi j'ai été élevé dans la, la culture du blé, quoi. C'est-à-dire que il euh, y a eu même une époque, on faisait, il euh, y, y a des agriculteurs qui faisaient de la monoculture de blé, quoi. Euh, ne pas faire de blé, c'est à la limite, c'était presque faire une jachère. Quoi. Et euh, donc, euh, bon, dans, dans les têtes, ça a été, dans ma tête, ça a été un peu difficile, mais c'est là aussi où le travail de groupe a été vachement important. Quoi. Donc, le premier levier, c'était vraiment ça allonger les rotations, avoir des nouvelles familles, alterner les cultures d'hiver de printemps, et puis ensuite, euh, et puis ensuite, euh, c'est aussi donc, je disais, travailler au niveau du système, c'est-à-dire que euh, ne pas raisonner uniquement à l'année avec la culture mais aussi raisonner sur, sur tout le système de culture. Je veux dire par là que, par exemple, on peut être un peu plus souple sur, une, sur la gestion des adventices sur une culture de blé si on sait que la culture derrière qui vient, c'est une culture de printemps qui va être peu sensible aux, aux adventices ou, ou sur laquelle on va avoir une famille chimique éventuellement qui va être très performante et du coup, on va pouvoir rattraper le, le, on va pouvoir rattraper le coup derrière. Enfin, vous voyez, c'est un raisonnement euh, sur tout le système et, 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 et multi, euh, à, à multi-entrée, si vous voulez. Donc après, il y a tous les, toutes, les, toutes les techniques... Euh, euh, qui viennent, qui viennent là-dessus, se, se, se greffer là-dessus, hein, le, 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 les dates de semis des cultures, les, euh, les, le désherbage mécanique à son utilité. Quand je dis les dates de semis, c'est-à-dire que, par exemple, on sait que, euh, par exemple, pour la culture de blé, euh, si nous, euh, le blé, il est toujours semé, en gros, euh, du 1er septembre, au, du 1er octobre au 15 octobre, hein, du 20 septembre au 15 octobre, euh, alors il y, a, il y a plusieurs raisons. À partir du 15 octobre, il y a la chasse. Donc euh, les agriculteurs, ils ont besoin d'être libres. Donc ils veulent avoir fini leur, les suites de blé avant le 15 octobre. Et puis, euh, puis c'est par sécurité, parce que c'est une période où il, fait, il, fait, hein, il y a un temps plus favorable pour semer. En plus, le matériel a vachement euh, évolué, donc on va beaucoup plus vite. Euh, mais en même temps, euh, début, au début du mois d'octobre, eh les, les, les mauvaises herbes, notamment les graminées, euh, type vulpin et gras, c'est l'époque vraiment prioritaire pour leur croissance. Si on, si on recule le, le SMI de 15 jours et si on ose, et moi, chaque année, j'essaie de reculer un petit peu pour aller éventuellement jusqu'au 10 novembre, par exemple, eh bien, on change complètement euh, la, la, la problématique des, des adventices et on en gère une partie. On ne gère pas tout, évidemment, mais déjà, on, on a évité toute une croissance de mauvaises herbes et, et, dès, dès, dès le semi du blé. Quoi. Euh, donc ensuite, et ensuite, il euh, y a aussi, avant les semis, ce qu'on appelle les techniques de faux semis, c'est-à-dire que... On, alors, et, et là, il ne faut pas se tromper, c'est-à-dire que c'est des techniques où on fait comme si on se met, on met en, en, en situation de faire pousser une plante... Sauf que ce qu'on fait pousser, on ne sème rien, mais on fait pousser les mauvaises herbes. Et, et on essaye de les faire pousser, de les détruire, de les faire pousser, de les détruire, pour essayer de les affaiblir le plus possible. Euh, bon, c est, c est, vous voyez, ce n'est pas comme la chimie, où la chimie, on met un produit, il marche. Ou il ne marche pas, d'ailleurs. Ou il ne marche plus. Mais en tout cas, à une époque, il marchait, ça fonctionnait, on mettait le produit, tout, tout mourait, tout était très bien. Aujourd'hui, c'est plus vrai. Et avec ces techniques-là, ben voilà, c'est l'empilement de, de tout un tas de, 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 de briques qui vont venir construire un système. Euh, par, rapport aux, par rapport aux maladies et aux ravageurs, eh ben, ça va être le, le, la, la, la même chose. C'est-à-dire que on va, par exemple, moi en blé, je, vais, je sème des, des, des variétés de blé. J'ai 5, 6, 7 variétés de blé différentes qui vont être complémentaires quant à leur euh, tolérance aux maladies, quant à leur façon de... Alors, euh, euh, 
physiologie, leur façon de, de, de pousser. Il y en a une qui va avoir les feuilles larges, l'autre qui va pousser haut, l'autre bas, l'autre qui, qui va taler. Bon, elles vont, elles vont utiliser le, tout l'espace et donc il, il va y avoir une, une moindre pression, éventuellement des prédateurs, éventuellement des, des, des maladies. Euh, sur, sur, alors, d'autres exemples. Et, et c'est, et c'est évolutif. C'est-à-dire, ce que je fais aujourd'hui, c'était pas ce que je faisais, euh, enfin, c'était ce que je faisais hier, mais avec des nouvelles techniques, et je, et j'ai déjà des nouvelles idées pour l'année prochaine et pour dans deux ans, et, et à un moment, j'ai arrêté de bosser, mais pas tout de suite encore, et voilà, ça, ça, ça évolue tout le temps, quoi. Par exemple, la culture du colza, euh, depuis, euh, depuis trois ans, moi je mets en, en pratique, je, je sème le colza avec euh, des cultures associées, c'est-à-dire avec de la févrole et avec du trèfle blanc. Et cette année, j'ai même fait avec du sarrasin. Donc l'idée, c'est euh, le, le, de couvrir le sol le plus possible, euh, de perturber, a priori, on s'est aperçu cette année que d'avoir plusieurs plantes comme ça, ça perturbait les pucerons. Ils ne savaient plus où ils devaient aller piquer, et du coup, euh, bah, ils ne piquaient pas mon colza. Et euh, le, la févrole a, a, amène aussi euh, piège de l'azote atmosphérique, et donc euh, j'ai, un, j'ai moins besoin d'apporter d'azote minéral. Euh, quand arrive l'hiver, bah, la févrole qui est à, à, en, en fleur, en fait, euh, bah elle, elle gèle parce que dès le premier gel, elle, elle est très fragilisée, donc elle, elle, elle gèle, elle disparaît. Euh, là, le sarrasin, il disparaît aussi. Là, le, le, le colza prend la place. Au moment de la récolte du colza, euh, la lumière, bon, évidemment, on enlève le colza, donc la lumière arrive. Et là, vraiment, vraiment, c'est incroyable. Le trèfle, euh, le trèfle, il explose, quoi. Il démarre et, et donc il occupe l'espace. Il produit de l'azote. Enfin bon, tout bénéf pour, euh, pour l'agriculteur, quoi. Bon, je vous, le, je vous le fais comme ça, mais ce n'est pas facile tous les jours quand même. Il euh, y a aussi beaucoup de... Mais je ne vais pas vous raconter tous les échecs quand même, parce que... Euh, mais, mais, mais bon, il y a, y, a, y a plein de choses euh, positives, quoi. Alors, après, euh, ce, qu'on, ce qu'on peut voir euh, en termes de, de durabilité, euh, c'est que... Euh, euh, les objectifs de durabilité du départ de la période de 2008-2010, on s'aperçoit que si on la compare à la durabilité des années 2013-2015, alors le tableau il est un peu compliqué, hein, mais en gros, on, 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 je suis toujours dans, j'ai, j'ai, j'ai gardé mes objectifs de durabilité et, et j'ai, j'ai, j'ai rempli mon contrat en fait quoi, par, rapport à, par rapport à moi-même, hein, qui est alors, mon contrat, c'était quoi C'était, euh, euh, en termes de durabilité euh, sociale, économique euh, et environnementale, c'est... Alors, en priorité, souvent, je dis, c'est dégager du temps libre. Donc, j'ai dégagé du temps libre. Et j'aime bien avoir du temps libre. Euh, j'ai étalé mon temps de travail. Euh, j'ai démontré aussi que... Donc, mon exploitation, aujourd'hui, je cultive 80 hectares. L'exploitation moyenne du secteur dans lequel je travaille, elle est à 100, 120, 130 hectares. Donc on peut considérer que c'est une petite exploitation. Eh bien je démontre, on verra tout à l'heure avec les chiffres, que mon exploitation est une exploitation tout à fait viable pour, pour une, une unité de travail. Et donc pour moi, c'était important aussi de montrer ça à mes collègues, quoi, qu'on n'a pas besoin d'avoir 300, 500, 1000 hectares. Et que d'ailleurs, pour la petite anecdote, j'ai des collègues qui me disent des fois, tu as quand même de la chance d'avoir une petite exploitation. Et je leur dis, ben bah, oui, ça, c'est pas le plus dur. En fait, il suffit de, d'enfiler un peu à vos copains. Mais bon, mais sérieusement, il y a des gens qui m'ont dit ça, quoi. Alors, euh, bon, ça, on peut se poser des questions. Euh, ce que je veux démontrer aussi, c'est qu'on, que, que, je peux, que je me dégage un revenu euh, suffisant. Après, euh, peut-être que je me contente de peu, mais en tout cas, j'ai un revenu suffisant. Euh, je réponds aux enjeux euh, environnementaux. Euh, par rapport au, au, à ma situation d'être sur des, donc des, des aires d'alimentation de captage d'un, d'un captage Grenelle. Et donc, euh, moi, j'ai l'impression que... Enfin, j'ai l'impression, d'ailleurs, je réponds aux, aux enjeux, puisque j'ai signé une mesure agri environnementale pour réduire les, les produits phytosanitaires, pour essayer de ne pas polluer cette nappe. Donc, euh, il me semble que je suis dans la, dans la bonne démarche. Et puis après, en termes économiques, eh bien, eh ben, oui, je... je j'ai des résultats qui sont équivalents aux résultats de mes collègues. Donc en termes de résultats, en termes de résultats moi je vais vous parler d'IFT, indice de fréquence de traitement. 
Sur le secteur, l'indice de, fréqu de fréquence de traitement moyen des exploitations, il est à, alors tout confondu, herbicide hors herbicide, il est à plus de 5,5, quoi, entre 5,5 et 6. Euh, L'objectif euh, région des fermes défi, euh, il serait à entre 5 et 5,5. ,5. Nous, sur le groupe, eh ben, on voit qu'on est quand même vraiment euh, nettement en dessous. Hein. On est à, à 2,5 pour le groupe. Et moi, évidemment, puisque, euh, du coup, c'est à moi qu'on a demandé de venir ici. Je suis un peu meilleur que le groupe. Je suis un peu en dessous. Non, blague à part, euh, voilà, on, est, on, est, on, on arrive à, à quand même vraiment beaucoup descendre l'IFT le, le, euh, par rapport à une moyenne régionale. Euh, là, ça, cam, ça cache aussi euh, une certaine diversité, c'est-à-dire que si on met à jour, et ce que je vous dirai en conclusion, mais euh, l'IFT euh, hors herbicide, euh, pas de problème, enfin, en ce qui me concerne, aucun problème. Moi, je suis arrivé à 0,5, 0,6 d'IFT hors herbicide, ce qui est vraiment euh, très bas. Euh, le problème, c'est l'IFT herbicide où, où je suis encore, euh, bah, vous voyez, je suis à 2, 4, donc je dois être à, à un 9 en IFT herbicide. Bon, la gestion des mauvaises herbes reste quand même le, le, le point le plus difficile à gérer. Quoi. Euh, et en termes en terme de résultats économiques, alors là, c'est un petit graphique où on compare à partir de chiffres de centres de gestion les résultats des, des fermes du secteur plateau de Saint-André où je suis et, euh, et, et les, les fermes des filles et donc euh, ma ferme à moi. Donc on voit qu'en termes de, de, cha, de charges opérationnelles, eh ben, je suis euh, évidemment euh, bien plus bas que, que, les, que, les, que le, la moyenne du centre de gestion. Euh, et, et en termes de, de marge brute, eh ben, eh ben, du coup, euh, même si j'ai une... Alors, effectivement, hein, j'ai une production qui est un peu moindre. Hein, on peut l'estimer à, à 5% en moyenne, peut-être, euh, de moins. Euh, ça peut peut-être monter, monter à 8% de, de moins de production, mais euh, les charges opérationnelles étant tellement plus basses, eh bien, en fait, euh, les, marges, les marges brutes, au bout du compte, euh, restent les mêmes. Quoi. Et là, on ne, parle que, on ne compare que à des charges opérationnelles, parce que, en fait, euh, euh, je vous disais tout à l'heure, c'est aussi une approche euh, euh, du système. Euh, ça veut dire que derrière, euh, moi, par exemple, mon temps de travail, du fait que j'ai beaucoup de culture, mon temps de travail est étalé sur toute l'année. Donc, je n'ai jamais de point de travail. Et euh, bah, du coup, ça veut dire aussi que je n'ai pas besoin d'avoir un matériel euh, démesuré parce que, parce que j'ai toujours le temps de faire mon travail. Alors, euh, en, en même temps, j'aime bien avoir le temps par principe. Donc, euh, c'est peut-être plus euh, psychologique qu'autre chose. Mais, mais voilà, donc j'ai du matériel pas large, j'ai du matériel pas puissant. Je n'ai pas, pas euh, trois tracteurs ou quatre tracteurs, j'ai un tracteur. Et, et, et du coup, ça veut dire aussi qu'en termes de charge de structure, eh ben, je suis plus bas que les exploitations euh, à côté. Quoi. Voilà. Euh, après, ce que je vous disais tout à l'heure, euh, il, euh, il reste des difficultés. Hein. La gestion des, des mauvaises herbes est une vraie difficulté. Euh, L'actualité du glyphosate euh, en est une autre, c'est-à-dire que moi, je ne labourais plus là depuis 20 ans. Euh, alors, je ne labourais plus mais je me faisais un point d'honneur à pas ou peu utiliser de glyphosate. Et alors là, pour le coup, euh, j'ai plus beaucoup de cheveux derrière, mais je crois que c'est un peu à cause de ça. C'est que là, j'avais vraiment beaucoup de mal à, à y arriver. Et euh, là, je m'étais dit, bon, il va falloir que je réutilise le glyphosate. Et puis ça m'emmerde. Et, puis... et, et, en fait, euh, et en fait, depuis deux ans, eh j'ai décidé de reprendre le labour ponctuellement, une année sur trois ou quatre, enfin principalement, je fais du labour l'hiver euh, pour les cultures de printemps. Euh, ça me permet de, de détruire les cultures intermédiaires plus facilement et, et de mieux gérer le, le, le problème des, des mauvaises herbes au printemps. Parce qu'en fait, avec du travail que superficiel, eh bien, il y avait du repiquage des mauvaises herbes. Je n'arrivais pas à m'en sortir euh, sans glyphosate et sans labour. Donc j'ai repris un peu de labour. Mais, mais je pense que c'est ça. C'est une évolution permanente. Il ne faut rien s'interdire. Il ne faut pas être dogmatique. Le, le seul objectif, c'est... Enfin, mon seul objectif, c'est de réduire, d'être le moins dépendant possible des intrants chimiques extérieurs. 
phytosanitaire et fertilisant. Et voilà, moi, c'est mon objectif prioritaire et je mets tout en place pour aller vers cette finalité-là. Euh, donc euh, là, voilà, depuis un an, j'ai fait dans mes champs, j'ai des bandes de biodiversité au milieu de mes champs. Alors mes collègues, ils disent pourquoi tu fais des fleurs dans tes champs ben, En même temps, j'ai des ruches. Donc euh, du coup, mes abeilles, elles sont contentes. Donc j'écoute plus mes abeilles que mes collègues. Et puis tout va bien. Euh, voilà, c'est voilà, sans fin et il y aura toujours des évolutions. Et si je reviens dans cinq ans, je vous raconterai peut-être pas exactement la même chose. Mais la finalité sera toujours la même, à savoir être le moins dépendant possible des intrants chimiques extérieurs, phytosanitaires et fertilisants. Et bah, j'espère aller dans le bon sens. Merci. Thank you very much. IPM in practice. And let's go to Leonardo. Mascariti Itolo. You have to uh, do the same. Grazie, grazie per l'invito. Buonasera, sono Leonardo Moscaritolo, agricoltore dell'Italia Meridionale della Regione Basilicata. Conduco l'azienda la, di famiglia, l'azienda cerealicola, in un territorio da sempre vocato alla cerealicoltura e soprattutto a grano duro, tant'è che il territorio eh, denominato tavoliere delle Puglie viene anche definito granaio d'Italia. Negli ultimi anni, grazie all'aumento del consumo della birra artigianale in Italia e il proliferare di birrifici artigianali, oggi di gran moda, abbiamo messo su una filiera dell'orzo distico che, stando, che sta dando buoni risultati in quanto ci consente di allungare la rotazione aziendale con sbocchi di mercato di, di successo. Da quattro anni circa sono eh, coordinatore nazionale del GIE Cerealicolo, del gruppo di interessi economici della CIA Agricoltori Italiani. E puntualmente con i colleghi di tutta Italia ci vediamo eh, a scadenza per eh, trattare i problemi inerenti alla cerealicoltura. Credo di poter dire che oggi noi agricoltori paghiamo scelte del passato che hanno portato a praticare per tanti anni la monosuccessione dei cereali, con il conseguimento di impoverimento dei terreni e di aver creato alcune resistenze delle investanti a causa di una mancata rotazione e del ripetersi dello stesso principio attivo del diservante per più anni. Fortunatamente le nuove riforme hanno notevolmente migliorato la situazione con misure rivolte all'avvicendamento culturale. Nella mia azienda da qualche anno ho incominciato a sperimentare nuove tecniche per cercare di risolvere i notevoli problemi causati dalle investanti che rappresentano una delle maggiori cause di insuccesso della produzione. Mi sono dato delle regole e dei metodi ben precisi per ottimizzare i costi di in previsione di una certa produzione, cercando di partire con il piede giusto, a cominciare dalla, dalle lavorazioni per preparare un bolletto di semina alla concimazione che non deve essere tanta ma nemmeno poca, alla scelta varietale che deve essere certificata e conciata, all'epoca di semina, alla difesa della coltura e dell'attacco delle, ma delle malattie fungive. Attenzione particolare, la pongo al controllo e alle, alla taratura delle attrezzature di semina, di concimazione e di difesa, sia per evitare dannose forme di inquinamento ambientale che per garantire un più alto livello di sicurezza per l'operatore, unito a considerevoli risparmi di prodotto e quindi di denaro. Nella gestione aziendale molta attenzione la rivolgo alla rotazione e all'avvicendamento culturale. Infatti, dopo anni lo diceva anche l'amico francese, dopo anni di monosuccessione, si sta praticando, si è incominciato a praticare prima una rotazione triennale, io personalmente adotto da più di qualche anno una rotazione quinquennale, di sei anni anche, inserendo grano duro, favino, pianta proteica, avena, orzo distico, lo dicevo prima, e trifoglio da foraggio. Fatta questa premessa, entro più nel merito cercando di trasferirvi 
quella che ritengo sia stata la mia più importante esperienza per combattere le infestanti cercando di ridurre al minimo l'uso dei pesticidi. Come dicevo prima, dopo aver preparato un buon letto di semina, applico la cosiddetta falsa semina, che consiste nel preparare il terreno con operazioni meccaniche, prevedendo la semina per una certa data. Da noi, la fine di ottobre, diciamo il 25 ottobre, è una data molto indicativa, molto veritiera. Diciamo. In quella data, anche se il terreno è pronto per essere seminato, diciamo che non semino, aspettando l'arrivo delle piogge autunnali che provocano la nascita delle infestanti e rimando quindi la semina di circa una ventina di giorni. Quindi nella seconda decade di novembre, dopo aver effettuato un passaggio meccanico leggero per estirpare le infestanti emerse, valuto se è il momento di seminare oppure di effettuare una semina posticipata, una semina tardiva. Negli ultimi anni ho optato per la semina posticipata, proprio per cercare di ridurre al massimo il carico di infestanti. E quindi arrivando, diciamo, arrivo alla prima decade di dicembre e dopo l'emergere di nuove infestanti procedo con l'operazione di semina, che negli ultimi anni pratico con una nuova seminatrice sperimentale e quindi una nuova tecnica. Sappiamo tutti che il più diffuso sistema di semina dei cereali si basa sull'impiego di seminatrice a righe che distribuiscono i semi in file distanti tra loro tra i 12 e i 20 cm. La semina a righe garantisce una minore copertura del terreno ed espone la coltura all'azione delle erbe infestanti che si sviluppano nelle interfile. In queste condizioni le infestanti riescono a sfruttare meglio le risorse ambientali luce, acqua ed elementi nutritivi, impedendo alla cultura di svilupparsi pienamente. La sperimentazione invece che sto mettendo in atto con il supporto del CREA, il più grande ente pubblico italiano di ricerca in campo agricolo, invece consiste nel seminare con una nuova seminatrice dotata di un sistema di regolazione della distanza tra le file molto ridotti, che più o meno 5 cm, a differenza dei 12-20 cm con il sistema più diffuso. Il nuovo metodo non incide sulla densità di semina, ma sul sesto di impianto, ovvero sulla disposizione delle piante in campo. La macchina simula una semina a spaglio, ma a differenza del sistema classico garantisce una corretta profondità di semina. Per ciascuna pianta viene ottimizzato lo spazio in termini di disponibilità di luce, acqua e sostanze nutritive, contrastando così la crescita delle investanti, sia un effetto campo di calcio, un effetto di prato, insomma. I risultati ottenuti hanno confermato l'efficacia del nuovo sistema di semina nei confronti delle investanti. Il sistema non incide sulla quantità e nemmeno sulla qualità della cariosside, garantendo un risultato migliore, ovviamente utilizzando specie cerealicole con maggiore competitività, tipo l'orzo e l'avena. È possibile anche prevedere, lo dicevo prima, una riduzione della dose di semina. Il sistema di semina esprime al meglio i principi della politica comunitaria, che sono quelli della produttività e della sostenibilità ambientale ed economica. Per me questa è stata la pratica che ha dato maggiori soddisfazioni, che insieme ai nuovi sistemi legati all'agricoltura di precisione possono tranquillamente rappresentare il futuro. Sono state anche altre pratiche che ad otto, ma che non sempre, hanno eh, come dire, dato il risultato sperato come la famosa strigliatura o il rullo dentato che serve a costipare il terreno dopo le gelate invernali e nello stesso tempo a togliere le infestanti appena emerse. Siamo nella fase dove la cultura e il cereale è abbastanza accestito, quindi la radice ha radicato e profonda, mentre l'infestante è piccola si riesce a, a estirpare. Queste operazioni però non sempre sono state efficaci, sono efficaci perché bisogna intervenire con il terreno asciutto e non, è, e non umido e questo non sempre è possibile durante l'inverno. A proposito di umidità e di clima, noi al sud 
non avevamo avuto mai problemi di oidio, ruggine, di serpatoria, perché abbiamo avuto sempre un clima asciutto e ventilato, quindi nemmeno problemi di micotossine. Solo negli ultimi due anni, a causa di piogge primaverili e temperature più alte, abbiamo avuto bisogno di intervenire con i fungicidi. Ed è per questo che nella scelta varietale adesso cerchiamo di individuare scelte resistenti a questi patogeni. Credo di poter dire che da quando applico questi nuovi metodi e queste nuove tecniche il bilancio aziendale è sicuramente migliorato sia dal punto di vista eh, economico, avendo abbassato i costi di produzione, e sia dal punto di vista notevolmente ridotto l'uso dei pesticidi di almeno il 50%. Tutti dobbiamo essere impegnati nel delicato compito di salvaguardare l'ambiente, garantire la sostenibilità ambientale e fare nostri tutti i vantaggi che la scienza e la ricerca ci mettono a disposizione. Grazie per l'attenzione. So, we've had two practical farm experiences and from my perspective, very positive experience, and I thank the two of you very much. We've got three other speakers here. Their job is to help you. Now, let's, let me put that to each one of them. Your contribution in the five minutes that you each have, how do you help these two gentlemen and other gentlemen and other ladies to have IPM, in arable farming. And we'll start with you, Everett Hamblock from the Coppert uh, Group. Okay, thank you for giving me the opportunity. I will first very quickly give you uh, an impression of our founder and, uh, and the company where we found the spirit to, to provide solutions um, for a more sustainable agriculture. So back in 1967, Jan Coppert was a dedicated cucumber grower. Diseases and pests were controlled with chemicals, but the efficacy of this method, of this method decreased every year. Jan Koppert became allergic and ill as a result of these products. He had to look for an alternative and emerged himself in a world of natural en enemies. Without Google, without Wikipedia, WhatsApp, or, or uh, the Sustainable Use Directive. He was the first to introduce a natural enemy to combat spider mite infestations. Since then, the search for biological solutions have expanded. Copper solutions are applied in over 130 countries. Copper produces sustainable cultivation solutions for food crops and ornamental plants. Together with growers and in partnership with nature, we work to make agriculture and horticulture healthier, safer, more productive and resilient. We firmly believe in the power of nature. Working with nature leads to a holistic approach which makes the cultivation of food crops environmental friendly and free of chemical residue. One of the examples of, uh, of the power is Pseudomonas chlorographis. It's a gram-negative soil bacterium used as a seed treatment for the control of seed-borne fungal diseases. It can be applied to cereals, including wheat, rye, barley, oats, but also vegetables, including carrot and peas. The Pseudomonas strain is one of the oldest biocontrol agents used in Europe. The application for the inclusion in Annex 1 goes back to 1994 in Sweden. Since that time, we have uh, new registrations uh, across Europe, going from the north, Finland, Sweden, down to the south over Denmark, um, Germany, France, and, uh, and Spain. The total amount of product, pro, uh, Pseudomonas products sold within Europe goes about 4,100,000 liters, corresponding to about 35,000 square, square kilometers. Assuming that the dosage for chemical treatment is about one-third of uh, the Pseudomonas products, we believe that about 1,350,000 liters of chemical fungicides have been substituted by this product. No single adverse occasion has been reported over the years, not even on earthworms. We are in the middle, or actually at the end, of a very difficult renewal process as we speak, and this product 
could disappear from the European market, mainly due to regulatory and procedural issues. We believe that biology has to uh, be treated as it should and not as chemicals. We bring life. We have natural solutions available for growers like these to rebuild ecosystems globally. Thank you. Thank you. You've got some information there. I have a little um, point that maybe Paolo would think about, and that is um, every year I get the flu vaccine, and every year it's a total change from the previous one, and everything seems to be registered within about six months. Does that mean anything in this conversation? Let me go to the second uh, speaker. Again, your job is to help these gentlemen and other gentlemen and ladies in their route to IPM. And this is Elisa Beitzen Heineke from BioCare. Where you go. I'm from BioCare. Uh, we, are, um, oh no, thank you. <laughs> we are a small company in the heart of Germany, and we produce biological plant protection products. So if you eat potatoes, corn, or pepper, there's a good chance that in some part of the supply chain you will find our products. For example, in corn, there's the corn borer. Uh, it's a very important pest. Uh, the larvae feed through the entire maize plant and cause enormous yield loss and also mycotoxin occurrence which is very dangerous for human and animal health. We propagate and sell um, the beneficial trichogramma wasp. It parasitizes the eggs of the corn borer, so the larvae don't hatch anymore. The application of trichogramma has a very good efficacy of 80%. But of course, it's not as easy as conventional pesticides. You need an exact monitoring of when the corn borer flies because if the trichogramma is applied too late, the larvae of the corn borer have already hatched and there's no effect. In some countries, there's already a good monitoring system in place by the official con consultation offices and the distributors. But in some other countries, we are still building this system. So in general, a more extended network of official consultation of, um, consultants would, would help us and the new bi um, bi biological solutions to be implemented successfully. However, the farmer doesn't only need from us uh, on, from our products to be effective, they also need to be cost efficient. My father has started our company over 20 years ago and has made it possible through working with the farmers, through um, innovative, uh, innovative production lines and small margins, that's possible in SMEs, <laughs> uh, to now offer trichogramma as, um, for the same price as alternative conventional pesticides. And if you also add a little fun to your products, um, there's a good chance or farmers are very happy um, to switch to biologicals. For a few years now, trichogramma can be applied um, with drones. For larger corn areas, we are right now developing a light steel tractor for our bow thrower who can apply up to 300 hectares of trichogramma capsules per day. Oh, yeah. So let's come to potato production. Wireworms is a very important pest. It feeds through the tubers and diminishes the quality. In cooperation with the University of Göttingen and Bielefeld and partly have funded by the German government, we have developed um, the granulate attar cup. It attracts the wireworms by emitting CO2 and kills them by infecting the wireworms with the metaritium bruneum, which goes out of our capsules. But there are around 10 different wireworm species um, in the field and we Fight, control them with one species, with one Metaritzi bruneum. And so it really depends on the wireworm species that are in the field how effective Atricup is. So we need to start thinking about having more than one active substances in our product to, be, um, to offer the farmer reliable um, and effective solutions. In contrast to trichogramma, for Atricup we need a registration. It's a pesticide. And which costs around a million euros. And the investment in the production line and development of the product is uh, at least another million euros. And 
we are right now in the lucky situation that we were able to obtain an emergency registration. So we are already allowed to produce and sell the, um, to sell at our cup. And so we have already have an income. The t registration process can take up to five years. So usually we would have advanced payments of 2 million euros and no income. And this might have been financially too risky for us as a small company. In general, there are less and less pesticides available for the farmer, and we quickly need to offer them new solutions and alternative solutions. We are working with low-risk biological antagonists, and there could be many more solutions available. But the introduction of these products into the market is delayed and sometimes even impeded by the high cost and long duration of the registration process, especially for us small and medium companies, um, which have the interest in small niche markets and m most importantly have the interest and the drive to quickly transform this pesticide market. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you very much. You guys have all been to business school. You know this five-minute rule fairly well. <laughs> Let's go to um, Paolo. You have uh, university, so what's the university going to do for these gentlemen? There's a, a few questions that are building up for DG Sante, but we'll leave DG Sante mind its own questions. What are you going to do for the farmers? Okay, uh, may I have the... Yes. Thanks a lot. So thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. So... Uh, when I got the invitation to uh, this uh, nice event, I thought that rather than, than showing you complicated scientific theories or, or, or graphs, uh, I'd rather tell you a story. I think it's a nice story. Uh, it's a success story. And uh, although it is from 20 years ago, I think it is timely to uh, represent it now basically for two reasons. The first one is that... Uh, it's a story, uh, it's a system that was developed together with farmers, and I think that uh, uh, we need more uh, research done uh, not for farmers but with farmers. And the second reason is that uh, it is representative of an approach which I think might and should become more and more uh, important in uh, European agriculture. So, uh, actually, uh, what I'm talking about is uh, this system. So you see a picture there. Uh, this is a, a system developed in a, a large uh, organic farm, 420 hectares, at least for my country, it, it's, a, it's a large size type of farm. Um, and uh, uh, the, in the arable part of the farm, the system was pretty simple at the beginning. So the farmer was growing one year durum wheat and the next year sunflower. So after discussing with the farmer, we, we decided to change the wheat part of the system into what you see here in this picture, which is basically a, a combination of uh, durum wheat and uh, a clover, subterranean clover, is an annual clover. I will come back to this because uh, the, the features of this clover are key for the success of this system. Uh, you can see from this picture that you have two rows of wheat followed by a 25 centimeter band of clover broadcast sown, and then another two rows of wheat, and then another band, and uh, like this until the end of, of, of the field. So the two crops are grown, uh, to, are sown uh, together. Uh, they grow together for most of their cycle. Then in June, in our uh, environment, uh, uh, is the end of the life cycle of the clover, so the clover naturally dies after producing the seed. And after uh, uh, more or less uh, one month, it's time to harvest wheat. Then after harvesting wheat, uh, it's the Mediterranean summer, which is usually dry, and after the summer, uh, we start having some, uh, some rain. So if you come back to, to that field, uh, let's say, in the next uh, autumn or winter season, you will see something, uh, well, that's okay, uh, basically what I have already anticipated. Uh, you will see something like this. What is that? This is the natural regrowth of the clover exploiting the ecological characteristics of this specific species, which is a self-receding species. It means that at the end of the cycle, the peduncle bedding, uh, bearing the seed is uh, brought down to the soil and the seed is released in the soil. So as soon as you have some rain, you have a natural regrowth of a, a cover crop, basically. So what is the purpose of having this? So uh, 
together, the two crops uh, uh, grown together, they cover better the soil. They are complementary because they do not compete neither for light, because one is tall and the other is short, and neither for soil resources, because one wheat has a superficial root system and the other clover has a tap root. So they explore uh, uh, soil nutrients and soil resources in a better way when they are grown together. And we can exploit here this uh, uh, peculiar characteristic of uh, subclover, obtaining another cover crop in the next autumn and winter season, pay attention without the need of resowing it, just exploiting the natural characteristics of this species. But that's not the end of the uh, nice part of the story, because uh, in uh, the next winter, when you have uh, uh, the standing stubble of the wheat and this nice cover from the clover, uh, you can bring, for example, if you have sheep, you can bring them to the field to graze. And this was actually the farmer was doing. And he was also renting part of his land to nearby shepherds, so having an extra earnings, just exploiting the characteristics of the system. Uh, and then you have some flower, and you can exploit the last part of the growth of the clover and utilizing it as a green manure crop, uh, providing nitrogen to the next sunflower crop, and thereby reducing the need of applying nitrogen fertilizers. So uh, this is just to show you that you don't need uh, to buy new machines. You just need a couple of adjustments to a classical standard uh, serial driller to set up the, the system that you will need to, to sow this crop. Uh, and uh, in terms of yield, you have a yield reduction of 10 to 15 percent compared to the standard system, but don't forget that you are planting 50 percent less uh, seeds of wheat. And why are you uh, having just a 10 to 15 percent yield penalty? Because of two reasons. First of all, uh, wheat has more room, so it can produce more tillers, and part of these tillers can bear uh, spikes. Uh, second, because uh, don't forget that you have the clover. So the clover is passing part of the nitrogen to uh, the wheat, therefore sustaining it for, uh, uh, towards production. Uh, then I mentioned the, 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 the reduction of fertilizer cost for sunflower, and I can tell you that about 20 years ago, uh, you could rent one hectare of your land to nearby shepherds to bring their sheep and let them graze for about 500 euros. So it's an interesting additional source of income to the farmer. Uh, this is just quickly to show you that the system was actually working for the weeds, but uh, as you can easily understand, it's not just a system meant to improve with management. It has many other benefits beyond that. Uh, I think that the most striking result is this one. The total biomass of the weeds, all the weeds taken together, at the end of the wheat season was 10 grams per meter squared. So maybe this figure doesn't tell you anything, but I can tell you that 10 grams per meter squared of total weed is just a very low amount. And consider that this is in a system which does not use any direct methods, no mechanical control, no chemical control, is just exploiting the, uh, uh, the features of the system itself. So I want to, uh, to conclude with five take-home messages briefly. The first one is that the success of integrated weed management, and this is a special case of integrated weed management, is based on diversity and ecological knowledge. We need to diversify our systems. And on top of that, farmers know that diversifying their system also has economic advantages. It can buffer fluctuation in the price of products and other uh, side effects like that. So successful weed management starts from targeted redesign of the crop rotation, and the two farmers here have pointed it out, this out very clearly. Third message, there are no silver bullets in integrated weed management. So we need a system approach, and we need to adjust solutions and be ready to change them uh, from time to time. And this is why I think uh, with management solutions that instead promote homogeneous cropping system cannot work in the long term. And uh, if we just look at what's happening in the U.S., uh, in uh, the areas where herbicide-resistant crops are used, uh, we see that now those farmers are starting to pay the price of a too simple uh, type of system uh, and too homogeneous system in terms of uh, herbicide-resistant weeds. Last message. Policy instruments are already in place. So we mentioned before 
the uh, Sustainable Pesticide Directive of 2009. So if we look at Annex 3 of this directive, we all already have all the framework we need for the implementation of true IPM. And I think that after 90 years, it's probably time to exploit this opportunity at the very best. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. I think the three of you have given clear messages. Now, we've got five or six minutes for questions and comments. Sir. Hello. Uh, bonjour. Uh, mon nom est Denis de Froment. Je travaille à la Commission européenne. J'aurais une question en particulier pour l'orateur, le, le, Monsieur Lozier, uh, qui a notamment signalé que pour lui, le, le succès du développement de l'IPM, de, de l'agriculture intégrée, chez lui a été le fait de travailler en groupe, comme quoi c'était essentiel, c'était primordial. Alors je voudrais euh, l'entendre un peu, peut-être avoir quelques questions à lui, demander, dit, par exemple, pourquoi est-ce que les autres agriculteurs n'ont pas rejoint ce groupe Pour, euh, Dans ce groupe, étaient-ce juste des agriculteurs Est-ce qu'il y a également des conseillers agricoles, qu'ils soient du secteur privé ou public Est-ce qu'il y a des chercheurs dans ce groupe Est -ce que, Et comment éventuellement ce groupe interagit avec ces, ces autres acteurs Merci. Euh, oui, donc, euh, ce, oui, euh, ce groupe euh, oui, s'est créé à l'initiative de la Chambre d'agriculture de l'Eure. Donc on a un, un conseiller agricole euh, animateur euh, qui, nous, qui nous aide, qui nous conseille, qui nous manage un peu, euh, qui nous... Qui, 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 nous, qui nous permet de rencontrer des chercheurs, d'autres agriculteurs, d'autres expériences, euh, parce que bah, c'est son travail d'aller de, 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 rechercher euh, comme ça à droite, à gauche, et, et c'est vrai que pour nous, c'est euh, très important. Ça. Euh, après, euh, effectivement, pourquoi, pourquoi en 2000, on était euh, 20 agriculteurs dans ce groupe et qu'en 2018, on est toujours 20 euh, eh bien, effectivement, c'est peut-être euh, peut-être le plus gros échec euh, dans, dans, dans ma démarche à moi aussi de vouloir vulgariser ça, vendre ça. Après, euh, je pense qu'il faut être patient. Moi, je, je sais que quand j'ai commencé à faire ça, les agriculteurs, euh, vous savez, les agriculteurs en France, ils ont des petites voitures blanches. Et je voyais les voitures blanches passer au bout de mes champs. Euh, euh, doucement, en souriant, et puis après, ils sont passés euh, encore plus doucement. Après, ils se sont arrêtés. Après, ils ont parlé avec moi. Après, ils m'ont dit « C'est bien ce que tu fais, mais moi, je peux pas parce que j'ai une grosse ferme, j'ai une petite ferme, j'ai des bonnes terres, j'ai des mauvaises terres. Euh, » Enfin, ils avaient toujours plein de bonnes raisons, mais, mais ça veut dire quand même que ça, ça évolue dans les têtes. Le problème, c'est que c'est très long. Euh, après, je pense que... Euh, je, je, je pense que ça peut évoluer, mais il faut que ça évolue. Alors, euh, je pense qu'il faut que ça évolue politiquement, quoi. C'est-à-dire que nous, euh, euh, dans le département, je pense que le, le, les organisations enfin, euh, professionnelles, euh, syndicales, n'avaient pas trop envie que ça aille dans ce sens-là, parce qu'ils parce que, parce qu sont engagés dans, euh, dans les différentes... Euh, euh, organisation professionnelle à droite à gauche et qu'il et que y a, je pense, des intérêts. Alors, euh, bon, je mets peut-être les pieds dans le plat, mais, mais je pense qu'il n'y euh, avait pas une vraie volonté de faire avancer dans ce sens-là. Et, et même à, à tel point qu'en 2000, euh, on, on parlait dans les chambres d'agriculture d'agriculture intégrée et, et aujourd'hui, c'est devenu un gros mot. C'est-à-dire qu'on ne prononce même plus le mot d'intégrer. Donc, euh, euh, vous voyez, c est, c est, je pense qu'il y a aussi ça qui fait qu'on que n'incite pas les agriculteurs à y aller. Et c'est quand même, il faut reconnaître, un petit peu plus compliqué, mais franchement, tellement plus passionnant qu'ils ont vraiment tort. Quoi. Um, thank you. <coughs> A question to both farmers. Um, yes, Martin Dermine from Pan Europe. Um, I don't know how it is in, in, in Europe in general, but in, in several countries uh, there's a problem of uh, 
uh, depressions in the farming community, that farmers are under pressure. And I, I wish to know, on the one hand, your, your job is getting more it's exciting, but on the other, you, you take a lot of risks. So I wanted to know how you felt, what impact it had on your, your own well-being um, and if, uh, if uh, yes, you have now many years of uh, ex experience, so you don't seem to regret it. But uh, in, do you think, in, do you think that uh, it's for most of the farmers, it's a good solution to to have a, uh, a better life? Okay. Does IPM lead to a better life? <laughs> Leonardo, tell me. Yes, sì, sicuramente. Eh, eh, lo stesso fatto di una rotazione più lunga, di aver allungato la rotazione eh, porta sicuramente a, a diversificare, quindi eh, abbiamo migliorato notevolmente il carico, il carico lavorativo cioè con le, le culture primaverili e quindi eh, e poi le pressioni, non, non capisco se ti riferisci anche a quelle eh, burocratiche, la troppa pressione mh, è giusto? Cioè, che significa? No, no non sento più. Non, uh, ah, yes, our financial pressure, I meant uh, the, the mortgages for Ah, sì. Have... <laughs> I, I, il mercato, sì, ho capito. Il mercato in questo momento sicuramente, almeno per quanto guardo, cioè in Italia sicuramente, stanno, stavano ancora vendendo. Fino a Natale c'erano le scorte del 2016. C'erano cioè, delle scorte del 2016 quando la qualità non era nemmeno ottima, non era buona e quindi il mercato era depresso. Oggi che eh, sono esaurite le scorte, l'anno scorso, cioè la, il raccolto 2017, è stato un ottimo raccolto per quanto riguarda le proteine, per quanto riguarda la qualità e quindi sicuramente dalle notizie che almeno eh, abbiamo il mercato dovrebbe essere eh, più sostenuto perché eh, i nostri mulini, i nostri pastai stanno prendendo meno prodotto dall'estero, quindi dal, dal Canada, soprattutto che è quello che noi dove importiamo di più e parlo per il grano duro, parlo soprattutto per il grano duro. E quindi siamo speranzosi che il mercato si riprenda dopo um, almeno due anni di, di depressione. Thank you. Euh, je, je voudrais vous dire, alors, en termes de risque, euh, qui prend le, le plus de risques Enfin, la notion de risque est, est, très, euh, est très aléatoire, en fait. Est-ce que l'agriculteur qui investit euh, avant, avant la récolte 500, 600, 800 euros de l'hectare pour une culture, alors qu'il ne sait pas du tout ce qu'il va récolter, euh, parce que le climat, parce que... Euh, Est-ce que lui prend moins de risques que moi qui ai investi que 200 euros de l'hectare Moi, je n'ai pas l'impression. Je pense que c'est moi qui prends le moins de risques. Mais euh, c est, c est, de toute façon, c'est un métier, euh, oui, mais à risque. Mais quel que soit le, le choix qu'on fasse, et moi, je pense que moi, je prends moins de risques. J'ai diversifié mes cultures. C'est-à-dire qu'une année, si le blé euh, fait une mauvaise récolte, eh ben, je me rattrape sur le maïs, sur le lin, sur euh, autre chose. Donc la notion de risque, euh, je, je, non, je ne pense pas que je prenne plus de risques. Je pense que je prends même moins de risques, quoi. Euh, après, euh, euh, par rapport au, au bien-être, euh, d'une part, je, je donne l'impression d'avoir la banane quand même. Non et, euh, donc, et ça, j'essaye de le vendre. J'essaye de le vendre à mes collègues quand même. Hein, euh, et, euh, ils me disent toujours, tu as, as de la chance. Tu fais, moi, je fais beaucoup de vélo. Hein, et ils me disent, tu as de la chance, tu fais beaucoup de vélo. Mais fais comme moi et tu feras du vélo si tu as envie de faire du vélo. Et, euh, Et après, euh, moi, je pense que là aussi, il y, aurait, il y aurait sûrement un vrai travail par rapport au conseil agricole. C'est-à-dire qu'aujourd'hui, nous, on est, on est très, on est très aidés en, en France par les conseillers agricoles. Mais en fait, aujourd'hui, les conseillers agricoles, ils nous apportent euh, une dose. C'est-à-dire qu'ils vont nous dire, au lieu de mettre 0,4 litres de tel produit, mais en 0,45 ou 0,5, tu seras mieux. Est-ce que le conseiller agricole, son rôle, ce serait pas aussi plutôt d'avoir un, 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 un apport plus... Euh, 
euh, psychologique, on va dire, euh, une, euh, une approche, voilà, pour, pourquoi je suis là, qu'est-ce que... Euh, alors j'aimais bien dire à une époque, moi j'étais un agriculteur citoyen, quoi. Euh, quel est notre rôle, qu'est-ce qu'on fait, enfin, euh, euh, plus, que, plus que de savoir si on met 0,4 ou 0,5, quoi. Euh, quel, quel est notre rôle par rapport à l'environnement, par rapport à la société, par rapport... Et je pense que quand on, quand on a l'impression d'avoir un rôle positif par rapport à la société, l'environnement, etc., bah, Déjà, on est, on est mieux dans sa tête et on est peut-être peut plus heureux. Quoi. OK, maybe on that, on that, on that note, we'll, um, we'll bring that to a finish, particularly since we have the replacement for Bernardino, I think, was the last winner of the Tour de France before you. Um, so we have, we have a replacement for Bernard. It's either he or, or Laurent Fignon, but I think it was Bernardino. But the message was clear. IPM lifts your spirits. <laughs> and I want to thank Leonardo and I want to thank Jean Bernard for their contribution in lifting spirits. And I want to thank the yes. companies and the University of Art, Elisa and Paolo, for giving the courageous side from their perspective and, and, and indicating what's there in terms of help and for leaving a few questions dangling for the next session. So thank you all very much. We'll have one minute while the speakers come up. If you can make a coffee that quick, you'll get a coffee. <laughs> thank you very much. That was wonderful. That was wonderful.
Okay, yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we, we go back to work. Please, I hope we go back to work. That wasn't very successful. Ah, you put it, eh? uh, You work on that one, I work on this one. Okay. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we go back to work, and this is the third part of the symposium, and we have um, a discussion, a debate it's called here, but it's a discussion actually, integrating IPM fully into EU policy making and practice. Two directors from the Commission, uh, Tassos Haniotis on my right, who has been involved in the development of agricultural policy for a very long time. I think that's the easiest way to say it. And Paola Colombo from uh, DG uh, Sante, who is responsible for the implementation of the directive uh, on sustainable use. And thereafter, then, Jutta Gutteland and Karen Kadenbach, both MEPs with a very big interest in this area. So let's uh, get going, and we'll start with you, Tassos. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, and thanks for revealing my age. Uh, this is the, the sixth cap reform or change or whatever you want to call it uh, that I will, uh, I'm, be, I'm presenting in my career from different angles, of course. Um, now, uh, I don't know how Paula as a vet feels, but I, I as an economist feel a little bit uh, uneasy with all the scientists in the room. So what I would like to do is put the big uh, policy picture to see and try to give you a sense of where uh, things in the future common agricultural policy could go and where IPM fits in, because it fits in, uh, theoretically it already fits in, but we need to see how exactly it does right now. Now, there are different ways of addressing uh, the issue that we have about the future of the common agricultural policy right now. I will choose uh, one of possible ways, but any public policy has more or less to answer to four broad questions. The order changes, but normally we should start by the why, we should move into the for whom, we should ask the how, and then we should end up with the how much, because every public policy has a certain money involved. Usually when we discuss about the cap, we start with the how much. Uh, luckily enough, uh, with the two elephants in the room of Brexit and the future uh, budget out there with all these unknowns, I can skip this. Mm -hmm. But uh, of course, it will have implications about what we're going to do. But that's why I believe that the most important thing that we have to ask ourselves is the why of the common agricultural policy. And I presume that most of you, if not all of you, have seen uh, the, and read the communication. Oh, it's under your uh, pillows in the evening, uh, trying to figure out what one line means compared to the other. I put it in a different way here. I change the order. And the focus here is on the why, on the objectives of the communication, starting w w with what should be the main driving line of the future of the CAP, which is the strengthening of the environmental and the climate ambition, because this is an urgent task that is coming out from any analysis one could do. The second thing that we have to do is better target the manner by which we provide support, because this is fairer. But fairer is clearly in the eye of the beholder, and we could have another full-day event of discussing about that. I'll skip it completely, keeping only one thing, that part of this targeting doesn't only have to do with income levels, but also has to do with the delivery of the public goods, the elements that I outlined before. Third, we have to rely much more on knowledge, innovation, and technology, and this is clearly where your discussion fits in, because it is modern, and not because modern sounds nice, but because agriculture worldwide is facing a major transformation, and in this major transformation, things are happening on the ground, you only heard some of them earlier on, that if the policy doesn't understand, catch up, anticipate future developments, very soon it will become irrelevant. And fourth, this is what has come as the big proposal of uh, the policy. I don't want to underestimate it, but exactly because I want to put it in its proper dimension, it's the how we're going to do that, the so-called delivery model. It's a new balance between what we do 
at the EU level, at the member state level, and at the farm level. And this has the potential to simplify enormously the policy if we do the right things. It has also the potential to go the other way, as with every policy proposal. I will skip very fast the what we intend to do with the communication, identifying that the first thing is we want to stress once more that agriculture is important, uh, and it is important we put there a provision of food, environment, protection, and jobs and growth. But agriculture has a, a unique characteristic. It's a very small economic sector, 2% of the overall economy, in fact a little bit less, and 4% of employment. It's a sector that covers almost 50% of land, 48% to be exact, and it's a sector that covers 100% of food needs. So the angle from which you see agriculture changes based on which of the statistics you take into account, and all three are correct. We want to consolidate and improve the CAP framework through broad avenues of reflection. Uh, why? Because we, we were told clearly to be neutral with respect to the future of the budget. So a little bit of the uh, details of what the policies would look like are going to come later on uh, uh, before the summer. And third, we want to prioritize simpler rules and more flexible approaches, because one of the things that we saw with the previous reform, that even the best idea, and Greening had very good ideas, could turn out into a bureaucratic nightmare if we don't pay attention to the manner by which the policy is being implemented. Uh, by the way, the presentation that I made available and you will get is longer and has slides and uh, other type of, uh, I, I, I summarize things here. When we looked so far into what the policy has delivered in its achievements, one thing that is coming out clearly is uh, the CAP has helped improving the EU competitiveness, and that helped the EU turn into a net agro-food exporter, mainly of value-added products. It had a positive impact on jobs and growth in rural areas. We have been talking uh, indirectly with model assumptions on what would happen if the CAP goes out. I invite all of you to look at the World Bank study uh, that was presented in our Agricultural Outlook Conference. It's the first time that so much data has been used. It combines uh, economic uh, data and payments data that we provided to them with a very detailed poverty statistics that the World Bank has and has gone at a nut three level and has found out that the cap is present everywhere with a positive impact on jobs, growth, and the uh, poverty reduction. And what the cap has done also provides relative income stability. That doesn't mean that the income level is nice, on the contrary. But it means that compared to the other type of volatility, income volatility in other parts of the world that use different types of measures, we have done much better. A simple comparison of EU versus US farm income in recent years gives this picture. But if this is on the plus side, there are some things that are left us wanting. The first thing and shortcomings that comes clearly uh, up front is we need to progress much more on the environmental performance of EU agriculture. That doesn't mean that we haven't made progress. The overall reduction of emissions or fertilizer use are indicative of progress. But if you compare the challenges we face, the objectives we have set for ourselves, and where we are, there is a lot that has to be done. Productivity growth in agriculture is mainly driven by the outflow of labor, which is a natural development, and happens everywhere regardless of policy. But we haven't seen much in terms of uh, capital investment or, or technology, with exception of what is happening in recent years that has accelerated some events that are interesting. And for, uh, then we have ongoing discussions of who gets what and the distribution of support that we'll also skip because it's for another uh, discussion. Now, from all the graphs that I had in the presentation and others we have in the background documents, I picked up one that in my view is the most relevant to what is happening uh, with your discussion. This comes from the Munich reinsurer, and it is uh, climate-linked loss events uh, in uh, recent years at world level. Uh, as you see, 2017 is absent, uh, which wasn't a very good year. And 2000, uh, if we put January 2018, maybe it could break all records. But whichever way you see it, whether we're dealing with storm events with green, water-related events with blue, and uh, temperature-related events with amber, we have had a dramatic increase in these events, which I'm pretty sure for those of you that are scientists, when you talk about pests and we talk about diseases, they have a very significant impact. And they have an impact 
that is running much faster usually than the results of research or innovation uh, is spreading uh, to farmers and helping them address it. So when it comes to strengthening the environmental and climate action, what we want to do is set at the EU level very clear wide objectives on air, water, soil, and biodiversity. And in all of them, especially in three of the four, integrated pest, pest management fits perfectly in. We want to set a list of available types of intervention that are suitable to achieve these objectives. I'll give you an example. We mentioned crop rotation. That's one of them. Member states should define the most pertinent schemes and operations that are based on these EU priorities and their specific needs. And farmers then would apply for these schemes with much more flexibility than what they have today. Some have called this renationalization. Uh, I remember vividly the time, I was much younger then, when we had one intervention price for wheat that was very high, uh, very different yields from 2 to 10 uh, tons per hectare, uh, very different national prices, very different uh, transport costs. Nobody bothered to say that the cap was renationalized. Nobody bothered to, to say that the cap was renationalized when we had seven beef premium, and I think that you remember very well. <laughs> now we have a debate on renationalization. Let's be clear. Renationalization is not allowing flexibility at the member state or at the farm level to address EU-wide objectives. Renationalization would be if we allow member states to do whatever they want and forget EU-wide objectives. So the first real test that we're going to have, may I? I saw you had it before. This is a gift that Michael has and said Global Soil Biodiversity Atlas. It's by our JRC colleagues. It also has a biodiversity map of the European Union. Our colleagues in JRC also present a map of soil erosion, of water challenges, biodiversity, uh, I mentioned that before, and emission challenges. Will this be the starting basis for member states to develop their strategy plans and then have the relevant and necessary flexibility to adapt locally and regionally what they have to do or not. And this is one extremely crucial test that, in my view, we have to pass if, in the future, the policy sticks to its EU-wide objectives. But it has to be clear that, based on what we've seen, we have to simplify the manner where, but by what we do what we do. On the better targeting, um, those of you that like the 80-20% debate, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do it today, not because I don't want to, but because we don't have the time, but you have, the, the, and you have much more slides and details about the distribution of support. What I want to focus on is this reliance on knowledge, innovation, and technology. And I mentioned before I used the term modern for that because we have also some internal and external debates uh, and do people understand this or not. In five years' time, can we imagine that there are going to be farmers that will not have smartphones full of applications? What is interesting to note is that whether they have smartphones or tablets full of applications, the first question is how many of these applications are pertinent and will be pertinent to their farming activity. The second thing that we need to know is that most probably there are either going to be US made, Chinese, or Korean. Yet the satellite images that will go to these applications for free are all European. And this is one of the few areas where Europe right now is at the technological frontier. Are we going to use this information to allow practices like IPM to be introduced in a flexible manner in the policy and help both member states to better achieve their national part of the EU objective and farmers have the potential to use flexibly the tools they want or not. To be able to do that, we have to look at the gaps that have emerged in terms of those that use and don't use this technology. With respect to those that have the knowledge and don't have this knowledge, and also the perceptions about science. And I will mention two things here. For things like that to work, the first thing that we have to do is functioning farm advisory systems. This is not only a legal obligation, it is, but it has to be a reality because that's another area where Europe is 
at the scientific frontier because we do have the scientists that could do this. Do we have, at all the member states, the capacity to take the knowledge that they generate, look at the innovation partnerships that exist, and transfer to this knowledge to the ones that need it? Second thing in the perceptions of science. We've seen all sorts of debates in Europe about the role of science. We have another debate that is emerging right now, big data. What big data? Big data on the other side of the Atlantic means that two companies control almost everything. And that's why farmers said, I want to keep my data, please stay away from it. In Europe, we have publicly available information. What are we going to do with it? Are we going to find ways First of all, of advertising that we have this information and passing it around, or are we going to enter into a sterile debate about uh, how we hide things that are already available? And I'm not talking here about what should remain private, which is certain things that farmers should have in their responsibility. So basically, I already described what we want to do with this new model of sharing responsibilities, where we have seen that the one-size-fits-all approach doesn't work, but we have seen also that there are practices that allow us to both modernize and simplify the policy. And what is more important is try to address these three <coughs> tensions we identified in the beginning of our inception impact assessment last year that we want to turn into synergies. The first tension is between the economy and the environment. And we have practices, and we saw some of them before also, that clearly indicate that it is possible to improve your economic and your environmental performance at the same time. The second tension is a tension between subsidiarity of member states and simplification. You cannot simplify if you don't modernize. But if you would really modernize, then we will be able to achieve this. And the third tension, which is also a very important one, is the tension between jobs and growth. From uh, scanning in, uh, in supermarkets, to uh, electronic banking, to robotics in hospitals or what have you, there is a real tension between what technologies do and their impact in jobs. Well, guess what? Agriculture is one of the few areas where you can generate more jobs with the use of new technologies than before, provided, of course, that there is a mechanism that will accompany this transformation and re-educate people from the farmers to advisors into what they have to do. And finally, this is all part of what we like to call budget focus on results. And it's not only like to call, it's something that needs to become part of our genes. Because we cannot keep expecting that we're going to spend all these tens of billions of euros every year without being able to explain what is the performance of the policy. That's easier to say than do. Because we have a focus for years to use output indicators to check and control what people are doing, we have to start moving much more on what the performance of the policy should be. And I'll give you only one example that went into the press release of the communication. The question is, why do we need to measure the width of the hedges? <coughs> now, there are two potential answers here. We don't need to measure the width of the hedges. Member states will do it. But that is not f focusing on performance. Another answer is, why do we need to care about hedges? Because they help with soil erosion, they help with biodiversity, and they help with landscape features. And that's exactly what we have to start realizing that we need to measure and link what we do with the policy with this performance. In all this debate, integrated pest management fits perfectly in helping this transi transition from conventional agriculture towards a much more environmentally friendly agriculture. What we have to resolve is how much of this is going to be helped with a conditionality, in, a strengthened conditionality in the so-called first pillar of the cup, in direct payments, and how much of this and in, in which way will have to be helped with voluntary measures that whether in the first and second pillar would allow people to transit to this situation. I don't have the answers in my pocket, but that's exactly that we, what we hope to do in the next months before we come up with the final proposal. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. For those who were expecting technical details about pesticides, 
you got something slightly different. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I was expecting something slightly different. Paola, you mightn't be able to escape as easily, but you mightn't want to escape as easily. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, um, actually, uh, I start by saying that uh, last year I was uh, attending <coughs> this very same uh, symposium, and I remember that I was on this sort of apologetic uh, mood uh, in reassuring uh, uh, the audience uh, about uh, the real uh, commitment uh, of the Commission uh, in uh, uh, supporting the Member State uh, in the implementation in particular the sustainable use of pesticide directive that one year ago was uh, dragging a bit uh, late uh, in, his, uh, um, in his implementation. And I'm happy now to report back to you that uh, the Commission and the Member State has been quite busy during 2017. First of all, we have finally published uh, uh, this uh, long-awaited report to the Parliament, to the Council, on uh, the National Action Plan of the Member State, uh, which were due uh, in 2014, and uh, uh, is also a report which offers an overview of the progress of the implementation of the directive on the field. The original idea was to do a report as requested by the directive, which was only focusing on the National Action Plan, which, by any mean valid piece of paper, but still piece of paper. So instead, we believe that it was more interesting to, uh, to give a more comprehensive overview of the situation. And for this reason, first of all, we did a survey to all uh, the member states asking to update uh, information on how they are implementing this directive. But we, are also, uh, we also conducted what we call fact-finding missions in six member states to see on the spot what these member states, which were selected on the basis of geographical uh, distribution and different typology of agriculture, what these member states were doing in reality. And this, in our view, provided, uh, resulted in an interesting report, which is complemented by an overview report, which is a product that we do normally at the end uh, of, uh, of a series uh, of mission. Um, and in this overview report, uh, uh, you can find a detailed uh, analysis of the findings uh, that uh, our auditor uh, witnesses uh, during uh, their missions. So you can see also the best practice uh, which we, we found in this member state, uh, the, the full result of the survey, and also the difficulties that the member state uh, uh, have encountered, are encountering in particular in the implementation of the IPM rules. We have also published a guidance document on the monitoring and surveying of impact of pesticide on human health and environment, which was another obligation from the directive. But even more, we also advance on a brand new web portal, which I really invite you to visit, uh, not only because it contains all uh, the various reports that I just mentioned, but, because, but also because, in, above all, include the links to all the website of the member state dedicated to the implementation of the directive and IPM. So uh, at the moment I think that we have 27 links. The last one is coming soon. Uh, but I would invite everyone to make full use of these facilities because uh, it's very informative, in particular to exchange best practice. We have also wrote officially to all the member states, to the ministers, uh, highlighting uh, uh, area for improvements that uh, we have identified in looking at the national action plan. And uh, member states are replying to us, 25 has already done, indicating uh, a very high level of commitment and engagement and uh, uh, the minister, the agricultural minister, confirmed this commitment uh, at the November 
Council meeting, highlighting, however, a number of uh, issues which are impeding or slowing down uh, the implementation, and I'm coming to, that, uh, to those a bit later. And I really would like also to mention here the Commission response uh, to the European Citizen Initiative ban glyphosate. Uh, you might have be very familiar with this. <coughs> because as we say in our response, this was really a moment for the Commission to have uh, an inside reflection on our policy on pesticides. And looking at the response, uh, you will see that many actions are uh, already announced uh, in terms uh, of transparency on, on studies, for example, for the evaluation of pesticides. But uh, for the sustainable use uh, is really AIM-3, the one uh, that is particularly concerned, where we have uh, made uh, a number of reflections and also a number of commitments uh, that we are going to honor. Now, Back to the focus uh, of uh, this symposium is integrated pest management. I start by stating a fact uh, because uh, when we had the first meeting with the member state in our working group, uh, there was some uh, uh, member state which was questioning uh, the fact that IPM uh, is uh, compulsory. So they were sort of saying, well, it's not really an obligation. It is indeed. And uh, I hope that now this is clear and well accepted by all the member states. So um, if you look at the Commission report, the level of uh, the implementation of IPM in the member state is various. In general, is reflecting the situation of the implementation of the directive in the member state, which remain quite patchy. You have member states that are more advanced than the other. And uh, on IPM in particular, the result is that it remain underused by the member states. The member states focus on promoting IPM rather than assessing compliance at grower levels, again, for, which is probably uh, um, a result of the fact that uh, they believe that IPM is not really a, 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 some, an obligation in our legislation. And uh, most importantly, there are no clear criteria and targets to measure the proper implementation of uh, IPM. And this is a problem, a, 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 an horizontal problem that we have uh, in all the implementation of the Sustainable Use Directive. So the fact that there are many, uh, many rules, many requirements that the member state uh, on paper indicate they are doing, but by not having criteria, by not having indicators, they cannot prove, they cannot demonstrate, they cannot assess themselves if uh, the goal of the directive, the progress of the directive uh, are, uh, are, are measurable and met. So let's start with a good note. Uh, first of all, uh, in, uh, the main finding on IPM is that in all 28 member states, there is a support tool, there are support tools for grower. Now, I, I heard uh, uh, some previous uh, intervention about the quality of this kind of support, uh, which is uh, reflected in our <laughs> observation, it is variable, let's say, let's put it like this. There are also in place uh, networks uh, over, everywhere for a pest monitoring warning system, Advisory services are everywhere, and uh, uh, also there are uh, demonstration farms network. We have identified uh, very good practice uh, that uh, we, I, I, I go very quickly, uh, but one is in the Netherlands uh, where uh, they have uh, a truly plant protection monitors with record keeping, which allow them to evaluate the success or not of the action taken. 
We have uh, also another good practice uh, in IPM uh, based uh, on uh, these uh, two systems, the ISIP and the ZEP, which are supporting, uh, again, uh, uh, farmers and the advisor in, making, in decision making. We have uh, the uh, SEGES, uh, which is, which is uh, the, the Danish uh, uh, Farm Advisory Service, uh, which has developed a number of tools, smartphone applications, webinar videos, which are very useful. Interesting also to signal uh, a good practice in Italy. We were talking before uh, about the variety of landscape, territory, climate uh, in Europe. In Italy, this is all uh, even emphasized, I mean, the difference uh, in Italy between north and south uh, is incredible, and Italy has decided to do uh, a sort of very generic, uh, broad uh, guidelines on IPM, which are now then uh, uh, sort of translated at the regional level and uh, in, in a more useful way, uh, declined uh, in accordance uh, to uh, the, um, the problematic, the difference of the territory. And Poland as well uh, as a very informative web portal. But more interesting perhaps after what we have heard uh, this afternoon are the obstacles to a better implementation of IPM. And uh, in uh, he hearing uh, some intervention, I think that this uh, is reflected a bit uh, in our findings as well. First of all, again, the absence of clear criteria for checking IPM compliance. Possible conflict between IPM and other requirements, for example, the requirement of minimum tillage. The lack of financial viable non-chemical control technique, lack of research into alternative way of control. Farmers, which are also legitimately reluctant to apply alternative methods to classical chemical if they face an acceptable <coughs> risk from an economic point of view. There are economic incentives that also may conflict uh, with using all available tools, lack of alternative to cereal crops in certain member states in particular, or poor financial return from alternative crops, lack of pesticide authorized for minor crops, and we are, we are entering also in uh, a problematic uh, of the low risk uh, active substance that I'm sure is coming back, and uh, um, the financial constraint uh, on the advisory system. The advisory system is, uh, as, uh, as just mentioned, a fundamental tool, uh, an obligation, and member states are investing a lot in this, uh, and the results uh, are mixed in, in this respect. So what are the next steps uh, then uh, for uh, the Commission? First of all, now all the various elements uh, of the directive are in place. So we are moving now to a different level, uh, let's say, of communication with the member state. Uh, before I mentioned that we conducted fact-finding missions. Fact-finding missions uh, are missions in which we are going to see what's going on, to gather information, and draw some conclusion. This is a lighter way of, uh, let's say, checking the monitoring uh, of, uh, of uh, a legislation of requirements. But now we move to the audit. The audit is a very formal uh, kind of inspection that we do in member states, uh, at the end of which uh, we gave a recommendation to the member state which they have to provide action plan. So the dialogue is moving from a very friendly, how are you, what are you doing, to let's move on now and let's see if you're doing what the legislation is asking you to do. Uh, member states now this year are going to send us uh, the revised uh, national action plan, and all these uh, should then lead uh, to a new report, which should really allow us uh, to decide what's next in terms of policy option. 
More specifically, we are working, uh, we are supporting member states uh, on IPM enforcement. IPM is a cornerstone of this directive. Member state uh, uh, has indicated uh, difficulties, so let's help them. We are doing this uh, through our work program, which is called Better Training for Safer Food. Uh, we have already planned 14 of such training, we, which uh, will outreach uh, uh, around 400, uh, 400 colleagues uh, in Europe. And uh, above all, and I think that this is most important, we are going to support the member state uh, in establishing criteria for assessing the implementation of the eight uh, IPM principles. And we are going, we have already started actually last year, <coughs> and uh, the next step will be a meeting with the member state to discuss this in March. And this is probably the most difficult challenge uh, uh, in, in, the, in the directive. There is a, an obligation for the Commission to establish a harmonized risk indicator. And this will be, uh, first of all, a, a very difficult challenge because uh, no one has yet clear idea of which we the most appropriate risk indicators to select, but they are hugely important because these will allow all of us to assess the level of use of pesticide and the impact of the risk of pesticide in, in the European Union, and then to decide on possible policy option, including the one evoked uh, in the citizen initiative. So, wish the Commission good luck on this, and um, thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Paola. What we've got in the next uh, 20 minutes or so three MEPs who will give us their perspective. Their perspective, at least I hope, from the viewpoint of two things. First of all, the work that you have to do in uh, the Parliament's uh, view on the commission, commission report. I, I fully understand the way these things work. But in the light of what both directors from the Commission have said, there are interesting things that you might be able to do that force Sante and Agri to be friends. The farmer and the cowboy should be friends. The <laughs> environment, of course, is not represented at this table, but I just mentioned them nevertheless. Because what's done is done, and it seems there's a slightly different emphasis now. But having said that, I'm only giving the views of a retired public servant. <coughs> Jutta Gutland, you, the job, as I understand, as rapporteur, can you give us some views from your perspective at this stage? And then I'll go to my colleagues on the left. Thank you so much. And thank you for this opportunity to talk to you all today about this important topic. Um, I think that we had very interesting pal panelists um, before today and in this panel, and I will take with me many of the ideas that was presented uh, today. As the uh, NV rapporteur on this implementation report on the Sustainable Use uh, Directive, uh, I will, and I also want to take this opportunity to say thank you uh, both to PAN for arranging this and also for Pavel for hosting it and uh, most of all to all of you who are here. I think it uh, shows how important this is. I want to say just a few words about who I am uh, and don't be worried here. I'm not going to be, turn into a philosoph about my existence uh, but maybe it's interesting to know why I think this is so important. Um, in my spare time, I often spend time in the countryside uh, in Sweden, in a small village in the northern part or slash 
center part. <laughs> we, we have a very long country. Uh, and uh, I put on my rain boots and I go out and I go on the fields and in the lands and the forest uh, in that very small village. And of course, for me, it's very important that um, it can continue to provide income for the people who work and live out of the land and the forest and also do so in a sustainable way. I'm also the mother who goes into the store uh, with some, uh, there I have some existential problems actually. Uh, I, I have so many choices that I want to fulfill. I want to provide my kids with uh, good uh, healthy food uh, who is good for them and their health. And I also want to provide my, the closest area uh, where I live uh, with um, uh, economic benefits. Uh, I think it's important to have it as close as possible. I want to be good for the climate. Uh, I want to make sure that we don't have unnecessary long transports. And uh, I have the same thinking when I'm in Belgium as in Sweden. Of course, I want to use Belgium uh, products as much as possible. And when I go to France, I have the same uh, interest in, in helping the local producers. And then uh, I'm also a person who, in front of this, uh, the last election to this parliament, was uh, direct, many turned to me and wanted me to be Madame B, who would protect the bees uh, and uh, their future. Uh, many beekeepers came, and um, it was friends, and many around Sweden who really worried about the death of the bees and how we see that happening in Europe and what that would make, uh, what kind of problem that would create for the future. And now, let's me very smooth go into what I think is the macro level <laughs> problems and challenges in, that Europe face. I think the common agriculture policy, when we now um, are going to revise um, it and um, change it, I think it's very important that we make sure that we have a heterogeneous system that will work for different kinds of farmers. Um, I also think it's important that we combat climate change and that we um, have uh, going into the next uh, to the future with uh, uh, sustainable alternatives regarding the uh, climate. But I also think it's important that we have people's health in our minds. It come, for me, it's both the farmers, especially the farmers who actually come close to chemicals and are the ones who mostly are exposed, but also uh, the public health, of course. And uh, promoting solutions for more sustainable agriculture and phasing out the toxic uh, substances from our soils, that is a really important part of this puzzle that EU needs to, to, to put together now. And uh, I think we need to step up our actions and make this a more important uh, task for, for the Commission and also, of course, for the, the, the deciding institutions. And um, I think um, the integrated pest management is a very important and fundamental measure um, in the sustainable use directive in order to achieve this good transition to the future. And the various and the recent reports from the Commission and also what was presented here today clearly shows that the Member States are not doing enough. And they are not uh, implementing the, the SUP, the uh, directive um, enough and uh, therefore they are not supporting the low risk pesticides and non-chemical methods enough. In fact, there are numbers of shortcomings that we see and need to be addressed in this progress. This is also something I will take further into my work and what I believe we need to do. We know that many farmers use established chemical pesticides instead of trying other alternatives, and that's not the fault of the farmers. They are just trying to, uh, to uh, make sure that they are growing the crops. But we need to face out um, the unsustainable pesticides uh, and m make sure that we have a usage uh, that is more sustainable. And if, in order to do so, 
Uh, we need to change the in incentives here so that farmers can reduce their uses of pesticides and to a greater extent switch to more sustainable and non-chemical options. <laughs> Accordingly to pr principle four of the IPM, the availability of sustainable biological, physical and other non-chemical plant protection methods should be given a preference to chemical plant protection methods. However, according to the Commission's data, and we saw it now also, member states highlight the insufficient availability of low-risk and non-chemical pesticides are a barrier to further IPM development. This means that there are not enough, enough uh, alternatives on the market, and we really need to adjust that in order to facilitate an, the uptake of non-chemical alternatives on the market. Furthermore, if low-risk alternatives are not are available, but they are not effective as uh, chemical ones or would involve higher cost, the users would not comply with the IPM requirements. And against this background, I think that we need to get a better understanding on how the development and the rollout on markets of low-risk effect. Um, eff um, effective alternatives can be for, further supported so that these products become more attractive for the manufacturers. In Sweden, for instance, there is a strong and still increasing consumer demand for organic product, and over 50% of the Swe Sweden's farms' land are now devoted to organic production. The EU average is roughly 6%, and I think we should uh, look how we can increase that further also. I also want to say a few words, I know time is uh, running, but very few words on a very important topic uh, that I also mentioned in my beginning, and it's um, about uh, the death, the mass death, I should say, of insects. German studies shows that in summertime there are 80% uh, diminished, uh, the insects are diminished by 80% over the last 30 years. Uh, years. I mean, I said 80%. That's huge. And this is really going to be costsome for the farmers and uh, for the production in the EU. And of course, this development is, uh, that's, uh, it's a tragedy if it would happen. So we really need to, to do something about this and increase our effort. And um, Unfortunately, biodiversity problems are not new. It's on the contrary. But there are many reasons for this decline, and that we can address. We can address why. Uh, the scientists uh, are saying that they want to look further into chemicals and what they are doing and what, what's happening. They don't think that it's the climate change here. They think, actually, it's the pesticides and other chemicals, cocktails, that is causing this problem. So, again, this show that how integrated pest management is really a central tool for the future. So I will conclude with how we can achieve the best actual results. We know that current practices in member states are quite diverging. Different countries are working with this in different ways. I think a certain amount of flexibility is necessary, and that's not a bad thing. After all, the directive and the situation in the member states differs a lot. Uh, therefore, it might be necessary to have a certain amount of flexibility for the implementation of the IPM practices. However, I believe it would be very valuable to provide more guidance and more directions to member states where possible. And therefore, I think it would be good to develop a set of common EU-level guidelines um, for the various IPM principles that would underpin the proper IPM implementation. For example, the Commission's reports show that the reduction of uh, quantities used have not given you uh, results, and that the reduction of concentrations of active substances could bring additional value, shown is in examples in the member states, um, not at least Denmark, has uh, been mentioned by previous speakers here. There are also member states um, where such guidance has been developed at national level, and that also brought positive results. So I think that 
feasibility on achieving greater benefits by focusing on concentrations rather than volume could be further assessed, as well as whether the practices in um, aforementioned member states can be transferred into other MS with similar results. There are many things to be said about IPM and the overall implementation of the directive, but I think I will stop here and just add that I look forward to the process ahead to maximize uh, the potential for this directive and the IPM to make the post most uh, possible contribution to Europe's uh, transition to a more sustainable future. Thank you so much. I try to thank really you. hurry. I thank, hope you you. thank you very much. Thank you very much. What I appreciate is that you have a full agenda and a document that will be worthwhile in so far as influencing this uh, love affair that I was promoting there a few minutes ago. Karen, briefly if you can, please. I'll try. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank you and uh, thank especially Pavel and, of course, uh, Jutte for, for their work and for the possibility to have this uh, symposium today. Uh, my name is Karin Kadenbach. I'm also a member of the ENVI Committee. Uh, I've been a shadow rapporteur on the, on the biodiversity. Uh, I was, a, uh, for our group, responsible for the seeds and plant reproductive material <laughs> regulative something uh, that was really in the media all over Europe, something people were really engaged. I was also very active on all matters uh, with Biene Meyer because I think this was something that really uh, yeah, hit the media, not only in Austria, but uh, in all of Europe. So, uh, and I'm also a member of the Agri-Committee. And uh, just being in the Agri-Committee and being in the Envy Committee, you get a lot of rather controversial and sometimes uh, rather diametric information on all that stuff. Uh, we have different information in different political groups because it always depends uh, yeah, who, who are the people, who are your experts, who are the people you uh, exchange with, who are the people you invite you to have discussions. So I very much appreciate all that, uh, what we learned today, because it helps me uh, to have an, let's say, informed possibility for making a decision. Because as a member of the parliament, not being an expert in all those pesticides questions, I have to trust somebody. And uh, as I do think that I, I'm responsible uh, for, what, for my actions to the voters who sent me to the parliament, I have to try to, to work and add material in their sense. So um, I try also to let my opinion be influenced by what I learn in the committee, uh, in the budget control committee where I'm a member too. Uh, and we did have quite a few of very uh, excellent reports from the Court of Auditors on subjects like greening, a more complex income support scheme not yet environmentally, or rural development programming, less complexity and more focus on results needed, or EU support to young farmers should better target it, uh, foster effective generation generation renewal. So we do have a lot of information from the Court of Auditors where we see how European legislation is implemented, how it works, and I think we have to have this approach that we are not allowed to think in silos, but really have to look at all those things, they are interacted. And one problem we see in all those legislations and all those implementations, we have this, as you mentioned a few times today, uh, the problem that it's very hard to measure if European legislation, if what we want uh, should be done is really done and if it's really delivering. So that's very important that we have this uh, criteria uh, to assess the implementation of the eight IPM principles and also what I'm really looking for is the harmonized risk indicators because right now we do have the possibility to get a lot of very controversial uh, information based on scientific data. So um, what I hope um, for, for the future that we can uh, continue this kind of dialogue as we have uh, right now, because we do see that the Europeans uh, the, have a great need um, for a healthy environment, 
healthy and safe food, and that's actually what we want to guarantee. And we only can do that if we have methods of producing uh, food and feed uh, in a very sustainable way, where we really know uh, that we can, or at least right now, we have to have some plant protection. Uh, so that's one point with the glyphosate uh, discussion I see. I mean, uh, we have to found our decisions on scientific data. But as politicians, we also have to take into regard <coughs> what people feel. So if we don't have good explanations, if we don't have good arguments, they won't trust us. And I think this is one of the big problems uh, we have in the near future, talking about the multi-annual framework, uh, financial framework. Because if Europeans do not understand why we need money for our agriculture and for the rural development, they will not be willing to pay because it's tax payers' money. So I think this is a very, very good moment to shape the future common agriculture policy in a way that Europeans know that public money is used for public goods and that it's them and our, our environment that will be profiting from these investments in the future. Thank you. And, and finally, Nicola. Nicola Caputo. Thank you. Eh, grazie mille e buonasera a tutti. Eh, mi spiace molto per il ritardo con il quale sono arrivato, ma questo è un periodo per me molto concitato in cui si eh, mescono un poco varie vicende della mia vita, anche eh, politica. Eh, in ogni caso mi sarebbe dispiaciuto di più eh, mancare a questo importante eh, evento con un, alto livello, con un così alto livello scientifico e anche eh, tecnico e politico. E ho voluto partecipare innanzitutto grazie all'invito di, eh, di Pavel, col quale ho condiviso di varie battaglie in, in, eh, in Parlamento, oltre eh, che con le colleghe eh, qui presenti, ma anche per l'invito eh, diciamo di eh, Pan Europe, eh, una ONG tra le tra le più meritorie e per il lavoro che svolge nella lotta contro l'uso di pesticidi e la diffusione di pratiche alternative sostenibili. I prodotti fitosanitari a basso rischio di origine biologica rappresentano una valida alternativa ai prodotti fitosanitari convenzionali e questo sia per l'agricoltura tradizionale sia per quella biologica. Infatti anche alla luce dell'evoluzione delle resistenze ai prodotti fitosanitari convenzionali i nuovi meccanismi d'azione presenti in alcuni dei prodotti fitosanitari biologici di nuova generazione potrebbero rappresentare un vantaggio importante. Tuttavia un certo numero di Stati membri rifiuta l'autorizzazione a tali prodotti a causa di una loro presunta minore efficacia. In una risoluzione del marzo dello scorso anno questo Parlamento ha chiesto alla Commissione, e siamo ancora in attesa della, eh, della proposta, una revisione del regolamento relativo all'immissione sul mercato dei prodotti eh, fitosanitari, finalizzata ad un miglioramento dell'attuale processo di registrazione delle sostanze eh, basiche a basso rischio, che di fatto si configura eh, a volte come una specie di brevetto, rendendo difficile eh, l'utilizzo di un prodotto avendo la stessa sostanza non registrata. Lo scorso ottobre la Commissione ha adottato la relazione sulla direttiva sull'utilizzo sostenibile dei pesticidi, la cosiddetta direttiva Sud, dalla quale emerge un quadro incoraggiante sotto alcuni aspetti, ma incompleto, eh, come è stato anche già detto, sotto molti altri aspetti. I piani d'azione nazionale costituiscono la base dei controlli degli Stati membri previsti dalla direttiva, ma presentano enormi differenze in termini di completezza e copertura. Eh, variano notevolmente per quanto concerne il grado di dettaglio eh, nell'illustrare le esatte modalità di attuazione delle misure e sono inoltre incoerenti anche nella definizione di obiettivi quantitativi, eh, misure e tempi per le diverse aree di intervento. L'obiettivo più ambizioso al momento sembra essere quello del, eh, delineato dal piano d'azione nazionale francese che punta a ridurre del 50% l'uso dei pesticidi entro il 2025 
con un traguardo iniziale del 25% nel 2020, riducendo così i rischi e gli impatti sulla salute umana e sull'ambiente. La direttiva risulta incompleta anche per quanto riguarda l'adozione da parte degli Stati membri di misure per tutelare l'ambiente acquatico dall'uso dei pesticidi, perché in assenza di obiettivi misurabili nella maggior parte dei piani d'azione nazionale è difficile valutare i progressi realizzati. Stesso discorso per la manipolazione e lo stoccaggio dei pesticidi. Solo il piano dell'Italia tratta nel dettaglio tutti i requisiti della direttiva, ossia lo stoccaggio, la manipolazione, la diluizione e miscela dei pesticidi prima dell'applicazione, la manipolazione degli imballaggi, eh, lo smaltimento dei residui, dei residui e delle miscele rimanenti nei serbatoi e la pulizia delle attrezzature. È evidente che queste sono tutte cose che andranno evidenziate nel prossimo dossier di iniziativa parlamentare eh, sulla Sud. In generale direi che la strada è tracciata, eh, molti di noi eh, sono molto concentrati su questi, eh, su questi argomenti. Eh, le politiche maggiormente all'avanguardia a livello nazionale portate avanti eh, dall'ONU soprattutto evidenziano come parola d'ordine la sostenibilità. Ogni altra politica contraria rappresenta il passato ed è assolutamente anacronistica. È tutta una questione di volontà politica, dunque, riuscire ad attraversare il periodo di transizione nel modo più veloce ed efficace possibile. E sono utilissimi incontri come questi che preparano il terreno soprattutto nell'opinione pubblica, prima che per i decisori politici, ed avviano con fiducia il confronto sulla prossima PAC. Eh, mi complimento ancora con Pavel per l'ottima iniziativa, eh, con Pan Europe e con eh, il, gli importanti contributi che sono stati eh, dati quest'oggi, che saranno ovviamente eh, tenuti in conto nella nostra eh, prossima attività parlamentare e spero che diciamo, questo dialogo che si è avviato eh, anche oggi eh, continui nelle prossime settimane e nei prossimi mesi per, affinché possiamo conseguire risultati sempre eh, migliori. Grazie. Um, thank you to the three MEPs. I think they've covered the ground. I could open for discussion, but I have a feeling that I would be respected more if I didn't, because everybody wants to have their dinner. Well, that show of hands convinces me. Thank you. I, I want to make a few very quick conclusions. The first one in relation to today. And I look across to the people at the table. Soil is more important than we have seen before in any discussion over the last five, six years when we have been doing these symposia. Soil is more important. Now, you might say, well, he'd say that anyway. The indications today in the first session made that very clear indeed. So we must pay more attention in whatever way we deal with uh, this directive and its relatives. The second point to make is that two farmers here this afternoon said IPM works for them, they have to work for it, but it works for them and it works for them in the Grand Culture, in arable farming. That's a hugely important message. It is as if President Obama was here. Yes, we can. <laughs> IPM, yes, we can. Or as we say at home, is Fader Ling. Yes, we can. That is possible. I've been encouraged, I'm not going to let you off the hook, but time is going to let you off the hook. But I have been encouraged, in fairness, by the progress that Sante has made over the last year when we were begging for the report, and by the work that you have been doing since. I read, which shows a further degree of lunacy on my behalf, I read the uh, the, the, the press release with the release of the 
of the report. And in the press release, the Commissioner for Sante said Sante would be encouraging and supporting member states to implement the directive. That's what he said. Now, I take that in two ways. First of all, the things that you are doing. And secondly, in understanding that if you go to DG Agri, who have a good deal of uh, power and influence and importance for this directive, in the cap reform, you have some real chances. Tassos said, renationalization is not relevant, and I think what you said was, unless EU objectives are being addressed. I think that's what you, you said, more or less. And EU objective is IPM, and it's not IPM to make PAN happy. It's IPM because it's European legislation, and it's IPM because citizens are looking constantly in this direction and because IPM is good for a whole load of other things, including soil protection. I think this meeting gives us some reason for optimism. And that optimism needs its translation into what the Parliament will say in its conclusions on the Commission report in driving home the issues that actually each of the three MEPs here mentioned, mentioned very clearly in relation to what is expected of a directive that is nine years old, relatively young, but needs a great deal of further encouragement to be translated into something that every member state can be proud of. And you have a huge task, and I wish you well with the task. Because there are benefits for health, there are benefits for the environment, and there are benefits for agriculture. So there's a lot of work to be done. Finally, having said all that, I want to add to the thanks that has been expressed on behalf of uh, by Pavel, or for Pavel, uh, in hosting this meeting now, I think, for the fifth or the sixth time. And I want to, on my own behalf, thank the organizers for having uh, invited me to be chairman yet again. It shows imagination is not great yet. Mm -hmm. So thank you all very much. Thanks to the speakers here and uh, to the interpretation service, my old friends from my environment days, and um, a safe home to you all. Thank you.